Rapper U8 Enum hardware type Assign numbers RFC. We'll just say uh, Ethernet is a one And this is 10 Ethernet Then we can do D uh, hardware length is easy hops zero zid is a random number seconds Seconds elapsed since the client began the address acquisition or renewal process. Flags, CI address. Okay. So we can do. I want to derive default on this whole thing such that I can initialize it with zeros, I think. So we're going to do a derive default. And we cannot do derive default, I don't think because these have, those are too long. So we're gonna do 128 divided by eight. And this will be uh, divided by eight. It's just, a, it's just a hack. So we can initialize those. And then we can do header is equal to d, uh, header default. Initialize the header to zeros. Okay, so now we can do header.op is equal to opcode request as u8. Header.h type is equal to hardware type ethernet as u8. Header.hlen is equal to six, six bytes for a MAC address. Header.hops is equal to zero. Header.zid, this is the um, this is our transaction ID, so we're actually gonna generate one. Let zid is equal to CPU RDTSC as U32. Get a unique transaction ID. Will be zid. Header.sex is equal to zero. Header.flags, well, those are all zero. To be honest, we only have to fill in the things we care about. Then, in the case of a request, we fill in those, easy. And the client hardware address, header.chatter, is equal to uh, copy from slice. This is the device MAC address. So this is uh, copy in our client hardware address our MAC address. And then we have to put in the magic cookie. Oh, that's the four bytes that we're missing, cookie. That's why we were off. So header.cookie is equal to this. And I think that's two big Indian bytes. Uh, copy in the DHP cookie. Uh, oh, too big Indian. And none of those have Indiannesses that matter. And that one, we don't care about the Indianness. And then this, we just ref this. Okay, and now we can do a um, device.send packet. I was gonna send that DHP request, and we should be able to see it. It's not correct yet because we don't uh, we don't pass in any options, but we should just be able to see that request in Wireshark. And there we go. We got a boot p uh, request <clears throat> coming through, which is good, and it's asking for boot request Ethernet hardware address six. We have our transaction ID, boot p flags, and then we have the magic DHP cookie, and then we have to set we have to pass these options. So we have to say a discover, and we have to look at what 35 is. So these are the options. Um, where are the options to find? Uh, 35H, OX35. That's uh, like uh, 50.
Where are the options? Updated by, okay, what's this? Obsolete stat. Coding long options. Yeah, I forget where they put them. Options. Domain names. I think this is it. DSP options. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Uh, end options is a 255, so we're going to do uh, let options is equal to, we're just going to make it, um, it's going to end in a 255, end options, and then subnet mask, I mean, we can just use these, but this is OX35, OX01, OX01, right, so that's the length, and then the so this is like the type, I think, 35. Um, and what's Python 3553? There we go. So this is the DHCP message type. DHCP message type equals DHCP discover, right? And that's the length. See, that's the encoding. It's really easy to read this spec. The DTB specs are actually really nice. Um, then we're gonna have the requested IP, and that's not required, but that's the requested IP to allow the client to request a specific one. We don't give a shit. Parameter request list, and this is telling us the things that we want to get. So we're interested in DTB parameter request list. And this is dynamically sized. We really just care um, parameter request list. And um, each octet is a valid DHP option code. Oh yeah, so we give it a list of option codes. And let's see if there's a summary of these. There isn't. So we'll want the subnet mask. I think that's all we care about. So that'll ask for the subnet mask. We'll get an IP address, we'll have the subnet mask. We don't really care about anything else. Router, domain name, domain name server, don't give a shit. So this will then send plus size of, and this will be uh, uh, U8, slice of U8s, options.len. These are um, uh, construct the DHCP options. And then we can copy into, copy the options in, do that here, get access to the DHCP options. Then we're going to do offset plus that to the same thing, plus options.len, and this is DHCP options, DHCP options, copy from slice options. So this will now do a discover. And there we go, we got a DHCP discover coming through, and then I don't think I have a DHCP server set up here. Yeah, maybe I don't have a DHCP server set up. Um, so I would expect to see the response. Router isn't acting as DHCP. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm kind of confused to be honest here. Um, because these 
these VMs should be able to get, uh, unless I turned off DHCP, which I don't think is the case. Oh, why did I turn off DHCP? Yeah, we gotta, okay, that makes sense. Force off. Um, delete, yes, new, OS dev, next, 101, DHCP4, enable, no v6, isolated, close. Did that start? I don't know if I started it. I did start it. Okay, now options on the VM. This is connected to OS dev. Yes, apply, go. Then text console. Okay. And then we'll set this back up on Verber 2. No interface selected. Verber 2, start, continue without saving, reboot, and there's a DHCP discover, and here's an offer. So this is saying, hey, hey buddy, you can use this address. So we have to actually accept that, so we're gonna have to send a DHCP acknowledge or some shit. So it offers it to us, and then we have to accept it. Yeah, we get the offer. That's easy. It just, it just literally tells us our IP address. We also want the server IP address because the next packet we won't actually broadcast. Uh, and then we'll request that. We shouldn't have to broadcast this, but I guess we can. We can actually use... Uh, we want the server IP address. And then we can use the requested. And then we'll get an ACK back. Yeah, we turned it off because PyPixie was acting as DHCP. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Okay. So that's the discover, and then we're going to do the same thing. Um, well, we'll parse this packet. And that response... Yeah, this response gives us a bunch of stuff. It tells us it's an, it's an offer. It tells us the server identifier. It tells us how long the lease is active for. Um, it gives us how long we need to, uh, how long until we need to check in to renew it. Uh, we get the subnet mask there, and we get the broadcast address. So... Yeah, I think we'll want to request some of these things, and then we might just write an options parser. Um, I might wrap this up so it's a little bit cleaner so we can have a little bit more code reuse. So I have like create DTP packet, and then we can have an options parser that will construct those options. Because uh, honestly, once we, have, once we have this done, which is honestly like, an hour and a half, this is probably an hour and a half or two hours away if we do this correctly. If we hack this in, it'll be working in like 15 minutes, but if we do this correctly, it'll be like an hour and a half, and after that we do ARPS, which will take about 10 minutes, and at that point, we just have pretty much arbitrary networking in, uh, in this setup. So... So yeah, I think we're probably gonna make uh, probably gonna make an options parser. Might as well. These things are all relatively simple. It shouldn't give us anything too complex. So we'll do an enum DHP option. This will be uh, repr. Uh, actually, this is just a uh, different DHP options. And so we're gonna want to parse these DHP packets as well as be able to create them. So we're gonna have options. We're gonna have message type. And this will have an enum. Um, a message type, actually. Uh, DHP message types. Enum message type. 
and this is at 37, 30, no, this is at 50, message type, there we go, we've got a discover, which is a one, this one we can wrapper as a U8, we've got discover, offer, request, decline, ack, knack, and release. Okay. All right, message types, that takes a message type. And then, I think we'll just like implement serialize on DHCP option. Impl serialize for DHP, uh, actually just impl DHP option. And this will serialize it. To do that, I'm gonna need a location to serialize to. I don't wanna make new allocations, so I think, mm, we might, well, I guess we'll, Probably write a parser first. So we need a parser for all these things. I mean, we only care about the ones that we care about, which is uh, least time. And we only really care about... Uh, these. If we get anything else, we'll just panic because we're not getting a lease. So we'll have lease time. And this is a U32. We'll have our renewal time. T1. It's a U32. Rebinding, don't care about that. Subnet mask. Subnet mask, that one will actually want broadcast address. Eh, why the fuck not? Okay, and then an end. All right. FN parse. This will take a pointer, which is a mutable reference to a reference to a U8. And then we'll say let code is equal to pointer, and then this can return an option, DHP option. And we'll want to consume off those pointers. I can't read, unfortunately, on that. But we can do pointer get zero, let len is equal to pointer not get one. And then we can do uh, pointer and length. And then the payload. And then here we can do unknown. Uh, A U8. That's an unknown option that we didn't parse. That way we'll at least, we'll parse all the fields correctly. And then the payload will be a pointer dot get two to two plus len. Okay, and then pointer is equal to uh, ref pointer to two plus, uh, two plus len. This will be uh, update the pointer reflecting what we consumed. Uh, get the header for the option. Then we'll match code. If the code is a one, it's really one subnet mask, okay. DHP option. And then at this point, we successfully parsed it. So this is sum 
DTP option sub net mask. And then we'll grab the payload. I guess we'll assert that that is payload to. Uh, actually, yeah, U32 from Big Indian Bytes, payload try into. Um, try into OK. All right, so if that is not exactly four bytes, then that will fail. Otherwise, we'll return a subnet mask. Use core convert try into. <clears throat> so now we're parsing that out. So this is going to get a DTP option. In this case, uh, parse. Yeah, we got to say A. And then this internal one lives for A. The other one we don't care about. And then this option lives for A. Um, oh, impl A. A. That'll take an A ref. Uh, oh, you can actually do this, right? Rust, I think, is smart enough in this case. No, not quite. 68. Pointer not get. We gotta deref those? Oh, um, pointer... Let message is equal to pointer. Uh, get the message slice. We'll do message. This one, technically, it doesn't matter, but we'll do it anyways. Oh, yeah, get does just return a ref. Never mind. Deref, deref. Okay, code, bunch of other things not handled. So, so that's broadcast address, message type two, uh, oh, message type is a 53 DHP option, message type payload, uh, try into okay. And that takes a message type, impl message, impl from u8 for message type, uh, invalid. And we'll just say ff in that case. Uh, fn from val u8 into a self match val to one return a message type discover two three four everything else invalid two three five request ack oops request offer ack one two three five discover offer request ack Okay, so now we can do message type. Here we'll do a U8 from big Indian bytes, it doesn't matter. And we're doing that to also assert the length. We're not just grabbing the one byte out of there. Uh, we're actually converting the whole slice into a U8 because if we got more than two bytes, it would not correctly coerce into a fixed sized array of one byte. Um, so that actually is the length check in the same line and then into on that. And that should parse out the message type. And it did. Okay. Lease time 51. Okay. So this is the 
so this is the least time. Okay, and this is uh, parse the option. Subnet mask, least time. Renewal time, it's 58. Once again, just a U32 for those. This is at 58, we have a renewal time. Uh, one. Oh, we never did broadcast address. We did subnet mask, least time, message type, renewal time, and then we have a broadcast address. That's at 28, just puts it here. Once again, this is the U32 network order, 28 broadcast address. Okay, and then everything else is a DHP option unknown payload. All right, so now what we can do is we can parse that. Um, <laughs> why do people talk, talk down on Rust? Looks like a clean language. I think it's mainly because a lot of the Rust, a lot of people who are into Rust are a little bit preachy, and that can get people to attack the language, not because they actually have any disagreements with the language, but because they have disagreements with the people. And, you know, it happens. So, we're only gonna parse out these fields that we care about. Parse out unknown to an unknown message type. Oh, and we wanna give the type, so we'll do um, x at this. And then we should be able to store the actual type. Yeah. So now we'll have the unknown type as part of that. And we can derive debug on this, given that this also implements debug, which it does. So now we're going to write a uh, fn parse dhp packet. This is going to take a packet, which will be a packet ref. And then. Uh, parse a DTP packet, and then we'll do uh, this will return option. Right now we will return none, but this will be let UDP payload is equal to packet .udp payload. and we're gonna need to make that pub, I think, and then we'll pull in create net packet as well here. So I'll just take a packet, 118, um, no field payload, UDP. So when we parse all this shit, we should just make all these pub, I think. Basically everything here is gonna become pub. So you can't change any of these things. These are just parsed out fields, so they're immutable anyways. So this will just give you access to these fields. Pub, 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 pub. Okay. Uh, and then in this case, it could fail. So we'll return, we'll question mark it. So if we got a valid UDP packet, get the payload. So we'll just say message. Uh, get the get the UDP message, then we will convert that into a DCP message based on a gross cast, which will be unsafe if it's inbound. So we'll say if message.len is greater than or equal to, uh, if it's less than, um, actually we can just do that in one go too. So we can do let header is equal to message ref dot dot size of header and we'll get that 
So that can fail. So if there are not enough bytes to hold a DTP header, and we'll use core um, mem size of. So let's say if there are not enough bytes to hold a header, so we're going to get it failably. Otherwise, we were able to get something that was the size of the header. And at this point, we can do header dot as pointer, not mute in this case. Uh, cast the header to a DTP message. So this will bounce check that in Rust. This will then get us access to that as a header, which is marked as packed. OK. Uh, 125. Oh, just ref it. And we can implement debug on this too. OK, 125. Oh, that's just a header. Honestly, it's pretty obvious what's going on here. I don't need the super strong typing. So header is this. So we cast the header into a header, which is safe because it's packed. On x86, it doesn't matter anyways, because uh, alignment doesn't matter. Well, technically, something could get creative and try and do an SSE operation on some 16-byte align thing. How many lines of code have you added, modified, deleted with respect to yesterday? Pretty much just added code today. We probably deleted, probably deleted like 100 lines of code. We've maybe written, we didn't write too much today. We've written, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 in here, 500 in here, and whatever this is going to become, like 200. So written maybe like, 700 to 900, somewhere in that range. We probably deleted. Uh, we added some stuff to MM. Yeah, we're probably we're probably at like a, a thousand lines of code written, and then probably a hundred deleted. I don't know, plus minus 30 percent on all those numbers. <laughs> no fucking idea. It's pretty hard to judge, to be honest. Get diff. <laughs> so get diff. Grep, uh, line starting with pluses. Oh, we've added 200. Oh, we've commit some stuff. No, maybe not. Maybe we haven't written shit today. What? Oh, get status. Get add. Ha 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 ha. That's how they get ya. Get diff. What? How do you how do you clear that? Oh, dash dash cached. Okay, and then stat. So that's so far. <laughs> yeah, I was actually, you know what? I was actually pretty fucking close. <laughs> it was surprisingly close to that. 872 insertions, 126 deletions. We were, we were pretty, we were pretty damn close. <laughs> we were really fucking close on that. Got a stat track in your brain. <laughs> Hell yeah. Okay. Easy shit. Easy. Okay, so now we need to receive a packet, which is actually relatively difficult. Um, we'll do a... Fuck. So this is the first point where we might have a packet we need to give back to the network stack. Oh, and is that gonna be per device? I think so. I don't think I want the device to have to implement that. The impled net device. And I can't have a structure. 
Yeah, net device might, we might have to convert that to not be a trait. So we, we can receive this packet, right? That's, that's easy as shit. So we can um, let packet is device dot receive, right? So this will give us a packet. Uh, or we can do uh, if or while. Uh, we can't do while at none. But we can do loop this if. Uh, if let some packet. Whoops. Pack packet is equal to this break, right? So that's once we found a packet. So that will go until we find a packet, but we want to be stricter, I guess. So we'll take a parse DHP packet and we'll pass that a ref to the packet. And that's going to give us a packet lease, but I think that'll coerce. Cannot infer lifetime. It has a longer lifetime than the data it references. Is it because of this? Is this fine? No. Um... Uh-oh. Maybe we did this in a weird way. I I feel like this should work. I, there's something stupid that we're doing. That has a longer reference than the data it references. It's not true, though. Pointer is valid for the anonymous lifetime 2, which is get lease. But the reference data is only valid for the anonymous lifetime 1 to the function body at 129. What? Cannot infer. I think this is an issue on our receive side. We say that this, yeah, I think we have to do this. A, B, where B lives for A. Net device that lives for A. I thought that's implied though. Can I can I do this? No, because I need to do it on net device, because net device. Yeah, I think I I think I did some of this in a in a weird way. That gives out references to things. Because I think that is this. B lives for A. So B lives for A, we return a B. We know that self is A in this case. Wrong number of lifetimes, B. And then if we get rid of this, this should complain. Um, net device a B and net RS 407. Ooh. Yeah, I'm, I'm describing this wrong, I think. I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back. Got to get my wine refilled.
Do you know of a C language course or book focused in cybersecurity in terms of like auditing, auditing C code or writing C code? Ah, fuck. How do I do this? Uh, Russ life times. I forget how you do these like complex ones. Uh, those are separate lifetimes. Multiple lifetimes, blah, blah, blah. Two different scopes. Thinking in scopes. Examples. So, not quite what I want. Quite what I want. I want the... Um, yeah, there we go. Advanced lifetimes. Fuck yeah. No. Is there no advanced lifetimes? Really? I like the new, I, <laughs> I like that, that's kind of cool. Generic lifetimes and functions. Fuck, lifetime annotation syntax. Blah, blah, blah. I want the like colon, why, why is there no Why does the new book not talk about this at all? God damn it, really? Really? Uh, do you know, um, for writing C? Writing C focused on computer security is just writing C. There's really nothing that would be specialized for computer security in that regard. Um, so I would just recommend just like any standard C, uh, courses out there. I don't know of any off the top of my head. Um, but something that's focused on cybersecurity, like a lot of people who do cybersecurity do not write C. In fact, a lot of people in cybersecurity can't write code very well. So advanced lifetimes. Yeah. That's the old book, right? Yeah, I think that's what I want. Why did they get rid of this? Unless this doesn't talk about what I want either. Ah, here we go, here we go. Um, lifetime subtyping specifies that one lifetime lives at least as long as the other one. And I forget which direction this goes. A as usual, and B that lives as least as long at least as long as A using the syntax this. So this is the um, yeah. So I actually have it backwards. Um, cyber security are skids. It doesn't mean they're not writing their own tools. They're just typically not writing like low level code or like programming, they're more writing scripts. And I would say writing Python to, f to like fuzz something or writing Python to send packets to something is a lot different than writing actual code bases. Um. If the world is trying to make a distinction between so security people and software people, you bet there's going to be a distinction. Oh, there's a huge fucking difference, right? There are two full-time jobs. <laughs> two full-time jobs. There's, you're not going to have, like, and, and that's one thing I really hate about this whole, like, new push to have developers write their, like, fuzzing and, like, make their own fuzzing tools to find their own bugs. They're two fucking different jobs, right? <laughs> 
A developer can do security research about as well as a security researcher can do development. And uh, it's bad for both. <laughs> what do you mean skids? Uh, script kiddies is what that is short for. But it typically is a derogatory term referring to like hackers who can't actually do anything themselves. They can like use tools. So like they could take they could take like an existing framework that like you put in an IP address and it like DDoSes that IP address or maybe uses a known exploit. Um, but they're unable to really be creative outside those bounds or write their own exploits or find their own bugs or write their own scripts that actually exercise some of these conditions. So, turns out pretty much all hackers are skiddies. <laughs> like, a, a very large amount of hackers are just skids. It's, it's, it's why it's a derogatory thing, yeah. Oh yeah, the short form, yeah. So, all right, so I think I always say this wrong. I say that B lives for A. So B is the smaller lifetime. In this case, B lives shorter than A. Right? No, it lives at least as long as A. That means A lives for less time than B. So B is kind of the master of A. Fuck. Um, We can declare a lifetime A as usual and declare a lifetime B that lives at least as long as A. At least as long. So it's so A lives for a, a shorter amount of t uh, shorter amount of time. Colon is outlives. B outlives A. Yeah. I think I always read it the wrong way. You're totally right there. Most devs aren't able to organize their own code. How do you <laughs> Trust them to achieve any real coverage and security. Yeah, I mean, developers are are typically unable to think about things like what is memory, right? <laughs> to them, it's like if you overflow a buffer in C, what happens? It's like, oh, I don't know, it crashes. And like to a lot of people, a crash is like not an exploitable issue. It's just like, don't do that. Don't don't specify those bytes. <laughs> uh, you're a wrong user. And that's something I hear a lot about when working with developers, where they're just literally, no, that's not the correct way to do it. <laughs> Most programmers in the world are absolutely terrible. Yeah, I mean, that's... I think, I, I think that goes for every industry, to be honest. Like, you could say the same thing about doctors. Like, 90% of doctors are literally just gonna, like go by something they think is right from something they learned like 10, 15 years ago, and they're probably too confident to double check or to figure it out, so they're just gonna like do the wrong fucking thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and a lot of people don't care about their work, and that's the biggest thing. So like a lot of people aren't gonna put in the effort to make their code better or make their practice better or like study and, and understand these things. They're gonna do like the bare minimum to make sure they don't get fired and they're gonna cover their ass and they're gonna go home as quickly as they can. That's kind of how it is, unfortunately. Um, trying to get a dev to specify even a one invariant of their current system. Most can't come up with any or even worse. Uh, come up with the wrong ones. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's really tough. And I think that's where I try to put it. I don't try and insult developers by saying they're not security people because I, I'm very confident in saying they're two separate jobs. In the same way, you wouldn't insult a, uh, like, a rocket scientist for not understanding how to perform neurosurgery, right? You don't, you don't get mad at them for not understanding that because they're two completely separate disciplines. Um, and thus, I don't get mad at developers who can't securely audit their code because that's why I exist. That's why security researchers exist. Now, of course, literally everyone in the world, when, whenever that problem arises, when there are two people who do something similar, every single business person in the world is going to try to find a way to make one of them do both jobs and then fire the other, right? Because, well, you have your costs. <laughs> but
That's the goal, right? That's the goal of every single fucking, when you go to DEF CON and you're walking around the conference area, the or like the vendor booth area, and it's all these like, all of these companies trying to sell these solutions to make developers be able to find bugs in their own stuff and, and make security all go away and be really easy. They're all fucking selling you snake oil because they know that the bottom line of a business developer, they'll see, hey, it is, I've got like, I've got a roster of $500,000 a year of security engineers that I am employing. So I would gladly pay $100,000 a year for your shit product that gives me a green button. <laughs> like... It's tough. They're two separate jobs. They're two separate jobs. The easier security is, the harder security is. But I love green buttons. <laughs> Streams looks like you can develop as well. I'm very lucky in that. And it makes me feel like a superhuman when I'm able to write code. Because a lot of my peers cannot. And a lot of my peers, if they have an issue, like a tool can't do something for them, they just can't do something. Like, they try and use a tool and it doesn't work in the way that they need it to, or it doesn't have the certain properties they want, and it's like, well, fuck. <laughs> Guess it's game over. <laughs> like, it's it's weird. It's weird being able to develop and uh, and do security stuff. I'd say I'm mediocre at both. Like, I definitely could be a better developer. Scary researcher I do think I am actually pretty good at. I don't think there's a huge amount of space to improve. Okay, so B outlives A. So A is the sub. B is the dom. So we're gonna say this is a B, and this returns a pack at least A. Um, so in this case, B lives longer than A. So we're giving a temporary reference to something. And B lives longer than A. That's, a, that's what I want to express effectively. Uh, and let's see if I, how I do that here. So net device requires two lifetimes. And that's where this is really fucking weird. Um, are there any C books you'd recommend? I think the KNR C book, the like standard C book is honestly pretty solid. It's a little outdated at this point. But other than that, I, I think KNRC will teach you the C language. I would use different books and different languages to probably learn how to actually code. Because the C language itself is relatively simple. It's understanding how to like develop something. Um, <laughs> from personal experience, go write some C and suffer with it. Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. I don't think B needs to be a lifetime in the trait. It could be a local lifetime in the method. That's what I thought, and I feel like I tried that earlier, but I didn't try hard enough. So we're gonna say this returns an A. I think I might need to do this. I think I might need to do it here. Yeah, I think I need to do B outlives A, and then here I'll explicitly say that's a B and that's an A, and I think this is fine. This is fine. We're just explicit, all we're doing is we're saying that the thing that it returns lives potentially for a shorter amount of time than what it takes. So in this case, we will have same thing, A, B outlives A. Then we have a B, oops, oops, B, and then that's an A. And then unexpected lifetime on this, beautiful, that's what I want. And then we're just reducing these. Uh, 417. You're totally right. Thank you for that. Just needed to push a little bit in the right direction here. Packet lease. Oh, that will take an A. And net device won't take that. And I think this is just fine. Oh, shit. Oh, that worked all the way through. Yeah, that's totally what it was. We just had to explicitly let it know. Because the anonymous... In, in Rust, the anonymous lifetime, if you don't specify a lifetime... Uh, all the lifetimes of all the references will be the same. 
So all we, if we didn't specify these, and we didn't specify this, and we didn't specify this, then pack at least would live for exactly the same amount of time that self does, which is not true. So we say that A is one lifetime, B is another, and it outlives A. So B lives for longer than, longer than or equal to A, and that means we're returning something that has a sub-lifetime of B. But B ultimately owns that object. Um, and now that works, right? We can just call parse DHP packet on the packet, and I'll parse it. Damn right it will. Yeah, that was totally right. I don't know why I was doing the crazy lifetimes. I did think that was a little fucked when I was working on it. So now we'll have a header here that we can print out. And this is the response, potentially. Well, I guess we just won't break. We're just going to parse everything as a DHP packet. Fuck it. We're just in a loop. Every packet is a DHP packet. Oh, there we go. Here we have a DHP response. And... Um... This actually looks a little fucked. I think this is just a packet that's large enough that it could be a DHCP packet, but it's not necessarily a DHCP packet. Um, where was the... I did get an offer. Okay, why didn't I see that? While there's a packet, attempt to parse it. Up here, get for up to the size of the header. Yeah, we should have seen that, I think. DHP discover. We do end up getting, I think this is the TFTP packet here. If we look at data, no, op3, htype3. Yeah, this is, this is not right. Um... I don't know why it's... I don't know why it's taking three seconds. Why is that sending... Oh, it's because it's... It's in a weird state. Um... Although that should be sending to our Mac. Destination is here. 5424. Uh, what is this? 70A6. And this was from 70A6. So we should be able to see that packet. A packet should come through. Um... If you want to write C, I recommend KNR and TLPI, the Linux programming interface. I I also really like um, uh, a Pew. The um, it, is it advanced programming in the Unix environment or something? It is advanced programming. So this is one of one of my favorite like programming books that I have read. Um, it's pretty thick, but this is going through like basically writing C code for Unix, uh, and it's actually fantastic. It's like, yeah, it's a thousand pages, um, and you can just kind of flip through and read a bunch of different shit about like Unix, how different things that you can do in the Unix environment, different syscalls that you can do, kind of the libc environment of a Unix system. It's, it's actually really cool. Prince got UDP packets of length this message len All right five one six Why are we not seeing this? It is UDP so we're seeing, this has 512 bytes plus the TFTP header, which is four bytes. So that's what we're seeing. That's the TFTP packet, but why are we missing this?
I don't know why we're not seeing that. Is that something we're filtering? Uh, print packet of this. Packet dot len. Uh... Hmm. It's on packet. Let's take a look. Packet. Where is it? Uh, impl packet. Okay. I thought we did a len. Oh, yeah, I do raw.len. To so get the raw length of the packet, and now we can actually see what we're receiving. We can see if that's getting kicked off due to UDP. Packet 60, 60, 342, and a 558. So we do see that. For some reason, we don't believe it's UDP. So, all right, I'll be right back.
Um, so we need to figure out why we don't believe that is a UDP packet. So let's take a look at what it looks like. Um, unless for some reason we're rejecting the IP. I'm gonna just add some panics quick, just to make sure it's not a dumb thing. Uh, panic, bad, IP checksum. Uh, it doesn't need a new line. And then we'll go to uh, bad UDP checksum. See if that's why we're discarding it. I don't think it is, but because we did test, at least the UDP we tested. The IP one, we didn't test this thoroughly. No, there's the 342. Okay. So there's something about this that we don't like. Oh, it, it's because it has some of these bits set. I think I can just ignore those. The DSCP and the ECN. Yeah, we're just gonna ignore those. It's totally what it is. Um, DCN, where's that at? Okay. So we see those sometimes, and then we should be fine here. Now we'll actually see the DTP packet. Okay, yep, there we go. That is a... That's a DHCP response right there. Right them there. All right, and then we'll pass in the zid to DHCP, the parse DHCP packet, and we'll pass in the expected zid. And yeah, I think what this will do is we can look through source port 67, desk port 68. So we'll say if We'll parse that DHCP packet, get the UDP message, and then here we'll say if, uh, actually we'll just get the UDP, and then let message is equal to UDP.payload. We'll say if UDP.source port is not equal to 67, or UDP.desk port is not equal to 68, uh, return none. Um, we only expect, uh, for a response, we expect these, this port conf configuration. This takes the zid U32. All right. And we do see it, and we don't see the others because we're now filtering on that uh, source port, desk port. And then here we can say, if header zid is not equal to zid, return none. Uh, zid did not, oops, match expected. And now at that point, this will make sure that we actually have the zid. And yeah, that immediately we got that offer. Okay. Sweet. See you around, Adamant Cheese. Hell yeah. Okay. So the zid did not match what was expected, and then we print the header, and that's exactly what we want. And we'll say, and here we're gonna like uh, sanity check some parts of the DHP message. So we're gonna say if header dot op is not equal to, we'll split this. Uh, if header.op is not equal to opcode reply as u8 or header.htype is not equal to hardware type ethernet as u8, should, should be in the Library of Congress. Oh, man. Thank you so much. It means so much. Lord Alpaca. Or the header... 
eight land is not equal to six. Return none. So this makes sure it's a reply, it makes sure it is a ethernet type, and it makes sure that the uh, hardware length that it uses is six. So we're just kind of whittling it down and making it more and more strict, but we still should see that packet because it validates, it passes all of those, op, h-type, hlen, zid. Okay, so at this point, I think it's relatively safe to say it was a DTP packet, um, I guess we should validate that it was destined for us because the offer, I don't think they broadcast the offers. And we'll look at just boot P. This will filter to look at just DTP. I'm pretty sure the offers will always be sent specifically to you. So we'll say if um, if the UDP, uh, I guess we don't necessarily know. We should probably filter that on our side. We should say if, well, we know that. We know that it's already filtered. It's either broadcast or destined for us. Um, we wouldn't receive something that's not destined to us. So we're going to add that in the networking requirements. And we will say the network, the net device is required to not return packets yeah but then I I don't want this to break if I want to do raw frames well I can get access to raw frames well this is my access to raw frames hmm yeah I guess I guess we'll filter it ourselves we'll say if the packet dot eth uh, map x dot dest adder what do we call it dest something dest mac if the dest mac is not equal to device dot mac dot unwrap or false so if it's not a, an Ethernet packet um, or that, uh, continue. OK. And mutable borrow on x, pack, eth, map, x, device, mac. I can't get the device Mac while I have this packet borrowed. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, we know our Mac. Let Mac is equal to device Mac. Um, save off our devices Mac address. Then down here, if it's not equal to our Mac, um, actually we'll say if it's equal, then we'll get a true, otherwise we'll get a false, unwrap or false. Uh, actually, if it's not equal, fuck, I, I hate this logic. I really do hate doing it this way. If the destination Mac, is equal to the Mac, then that will be true. So if that not, and then unwrap or false. So by default, it'll be false. Otherwise, we will get the internal part, which will be true. Okay, so this should work. So this will filter for things destined to our Mac. We don't have an IP yet, so we don't care about IP. All right, so this now sent us something, and we have an address that it gave us, and we have a cookie. Oh, let's check the DHP cookie. OX62, or uh, um, OX6, yeah, this. Here we'll do DHP cookie. Mm mm mm, delish. Const DHP cookie, U32 is equal to this. Uh, the magic DHP cookie. All right, so then down here, 
or header.cookie is not equal to DHP cookie. And this will be uh, from big Endian. Ah, and we'll do two big Endian. So that's the first 32-bit value we grab, but we need to make sure that we're swapping Endianness because we haven't actually set Endianness on our side of things. Okay, so this will get a, there we go. There's the response. And at this point, we have validated it's destined to our MAC address. All of the, it's a reply. The hardware type is ethernet. The hardware size is six bytes, which is the size of a MAC in bytes. Uh, the zid matches what we sent it, the cookie matches. So at this point, I think it's pretty damn safe to say that this is the reply that we were expecting. <laughs> So we're going to go and we're going to parse these options. Oh, yeah, and uh, 255. Uh, we'll do this. Let's options is equal to message size of header dot dot. Uh-huh. While options, and this is a reference, and this will be a mutable reference. While options.len is greater than zero, options print. So this will print all of the DHP options. So we'll print uh, DHP option colon colon parse. Parse, mutable reference to options. That'll allow that to get updated while the, lang while the length is greater than zero. Okay, this, I think, is roughly what I want to express. Um, uh, function call. <laughs> ah, yes, native Indians. Native Indianness. I do enjoy history. Hell yeah. None, none. Um, really? Pointer two plus len. Now let's try it again. Okay, let's, uh, we'll panic here. Panic, foop. I want to see if the first one parses. Do, do, do. Now I got to wait for the offer. There's the offer. Yeah, it's message type offer. Okay. Well, options len is greater than zero. Mute options. Mutable reference to a slice of bytes. We update the pointer. Eventually it gets to none. All right, yeah, we can do this. When we're going through all these, let option is equal to this. And then we can print, we'll print option unwrap. That'll cause it to panic when we hit the none case. So we'll see what we get here. Do, 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 we wait, we wait, there we go. Ah, yes, that would make sense. That will slice it up incorrectly. And then everything's, we have a bunch of unknowns. 255 ends it. So we'll say at 255, is that actually what I would expect? There's some remaining bytes after it. Just some padding shit. And that padding is included in part of the it's part of the bootstrap offer. Okay, yeah, they padded it out. Okay. No problem. We can ignore the padding. So we'll say this is a DHP option um end. And then we'll set the length. We'll set the pointer is equal to ref pointer pointer.len, and this will um, 
uh, terminate the list of options, and then we'll return none. Okay, so this will only print until the end at this point. There we go. Message type offer, we have an unknown, which is a 54. Uh, looks like an IP address. We've got a lease time, 3,600. We've got a renewal time, which is 1,800. Unknown, 59. Who cares? We've got a subnet mask and a broadcast address. Fuck yeah. Hell yeah. And then it ends. So these are all the options. Oh my god, so easy, man. Parse out the options. Stringer! Hell yeah, thanks for the big ass raid. How was your stream? Hello there, sir. How are you doing? Archification. I actually really like that name. It's pretty cool. How did, how did you get that name? All right, so... For all y'all hopping over here, uh, oh, you ever do any f uh, router firmware reversing? I do. I've done a decent amount of router firmware reversing in my time. <laughs> Gentuification is taken. <laughs> Are we all Gentoo users here? I'm not, but I used to be. I I used to be, I used to be the um, Gentoo is for Ricers person. I think the original, it was funroll-loops.info, and someone, uh, the owner of that page actually took it down. But I was exactly that person. Where's the, someone's got to have a archive of it. Yeah, Gentoo is for Ricers, and it's like, what are your C flags? Dash dash OMG optimize, <laughs> and you gotta set all your flags. <laughs> it's so good because it's it's exactly what I used to do. I would I would build everything from scratch with all these nutty flags, fun roll loops. I'd make sure that I had it specifically targeted for my uh, hardware March native, MCPU native. <laughs> God, this is such a like. I remember when I first saw this, and I was like, God damn it, it's so fucking true. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> I have since moved to Debian Stable, so I'm kind of the opposite. In terms of router firmware reversing, yes, I've done a decent amount of router firmware reversing. Uh, I've worked on relatively obscure routers. I don't really work on home routers. I've worked on uh, things that are a little bit harder to get. How did I come up with the archification? Well, I run Arch Linux. I guess that's fair. I'm interested in architecture. I'm interested in archery. I play an archer in just about every game I play. So I just arch everything. <laughs> I just made the daily OS transition from Windows 10 to Debian Buster. Hell yeah. Uh, be careful on... Uh, actually, Buster... Yeah, that's not Sid. For some reason, I w thought you said Sid. Uh, I used to run Debian Sid and... Woo! That's their, like, nightly, effectively. Oof. Risky. Risky. I, I broke things so many fucking times when I did that. So, for everyone who just came over, uh, yesterday we implemented a uh, E1000 network driver for our, the operating system project we're working on. And then, uh, today we've been working on making some network utilities for that. So, we added a UDP stack. We added an IP stack, because it's part of the EDP stack, but I like to say that we did more. Uh, we added an Ethernet stack. Uh, <laughs> uh, but right now we're actually working on a DHCP handler, specifically a DHCP v4 for IPv4 clients. And what we're doing is we just got this building in a way that we can send a DHCP request, which you'll see pop up over here. We send a discover. And then when the offer comes in, we parse that offer and we validate that the, it was destined for us. It was, an, it was a response to the discover that we originally sent. And then we parse out some of these dynamic option fields into nice Rust structures. And this is going to tell us information about our lease. We actually know our address here is what it's giving us. So we're gonna parse this information out. We have the information we want, mainly lease time, renewal time, and our IP address, and we want to store the server's IP address too, because that's useful to have. 
Um, but yeah, that's where we are right now. See everyone, he's dragging his window borders with the- Were you talking shit? Were you talking shit about my mouse- mouse usage? So it sounds like you're talking shit about my mouse usage. <laughs> I love the mouse, man. It's a- it's a great implement for manipulating the computer. I was talking shit. Well, why don't you just unplug your goddamn mouse <laughs> and never use that again? Just Alt-Tab, use keyboard shortcuts. I've done that so many fucking times where I've like, my mouse is screwed up or I have two USB ports and I have like one is my USB stick and the other is my keyboard and it's like shit, I gotta transfer off of this. On Windows it's actually honestly not too bad to do keyboard only. I use a trackpad. <sighs> Anytime I see someone using a trackpad, I really question their productivity levels. <laughs> I, I can't do shit on a trackpad. If I have, if I'm traveling and I have my laptop and there's a table nearby, I'm whipping out my damn mouse pad and my mouse and we're mousing it up there. No way in a hell am I using a trackpad unless I'm forced to, like I'm actually on a plane. But even then, I'll try and find a way to fit my mouse on my like armrest. Um, does high-level programming translate to low-level stuff at all? I'm totally lost in this code, to be honest. Ah, uh, high-level code, I mean, all development is development in terms of, like, your goals and structuring things and thinking about the problems that you want to solve and kind of the higher-level programmer concepts. But a lot of the actual implementation of things starts to get lost at kind of a lower level, for sure. My internet's dead, gotta go to bed. Well, get some good sleep, man. See you around. Thanks so much for the host. Now we'll start taking over Europe. When Europe starts waking up in two hours, we'll, we'll bring all of Europe to this stream. <laughs> Instead of dragging your Vim splits around with your mouse, have you considered using i3 hotkeys to resize windows? Well, I'm using DWM, so I don't have any of that fancy stuff. That being said, uh, I think Vim splits are... Uh, better because you can copy and paste and you can share the same yank buffers. It's already 9 a.m., bruv? Okay, well, 9 a.m. is pretty early, I don't say. <laughs> Been awake for two hours already? Oh my god. How is it already, how is it already 9 o'clock in Europe? Fucking crazy, man. Alright, so we parse out these options. We really only care about the type for this first level, but we'll return... Fuck, do I make a dynamic allocation? Do I return a vector? I don't care. I don't care. We'll return a vector of the options. So we'll return the DHCP packet. And we should be able to implement clone and copy for this. Uh, for the header. So we'll, this will return a header. So this will parse it out fully. So we'll have a header and then a vector of DHCP options. Okay. So we'll just return that shit right out there and clean those up. Okay. Ooh, no vec. Uh, use alloc vec. We can definitely do dynamic allocations at this stage. No problem. Okay, so now we will return this information out. So we'll do uh, let mute DHP options is equal to vec new. And then here we'll just do, oh, and if one specifies a length of zero, oh, we'll just eventually stop parsing. So while options length is greater than zero, if let sum option is equal to parse the options, else break uh, stop on the first invalid option, then we can do DHP options dot push. So this will attempt to parse the option. Uh, option was valid, store it. Then we'll pass the option here. And then at the end, we will return a DREF of the header. 
and the DHCP options in a sum. All right, we did it. Press out the options. Okay, so at this point, we will send a DHCP message. Yeah, and we should have that construct options too. <laughs> when he said Europe, he basically meant Russia probably. Yeah, I guess that's fair. Right now I don't have school, so it's pretty early. Oh yeah, that's so strange. Because a lot of people don't have school while uh, coronavirus is happening. I guess some people are doing like school remote, but a lot of schools just are literally not doing anything. So I'm curious, man, why are you building a kernel in Rust? Is this whole project a tool for you to learn Rust on a deep level? Uh, or do you plan on having a useful use case? So I have a useful use case for this. Uh, well, two uh, use cases for this. One is for CPU research, uh, for looking for bugs like Spectre and Meltdown in Intel, AMD processors, whatever I want. In fact, a lot of this kernel will be portable to ARM64, and I eventually will probably support this on ARM64. Um, so effectively, uh, I will use this for CPU research and observing some microarchitectural behavior and kind of documenting how Intel processors work, uh, like defining their undefined behavior is how I would like to say it. Um, and then also, I will build a hypervisor in this that will be capable of running Windows and Linux, and I'll be able to use that hypervisor to fuzz uh, whatever target I have in there to look for security bugs of software. Um, that's something that I've been doing for the past five or six years. I've been doing OS dev to write hypervisors uh, to then fuzz things. So this is honestly just a refresher. We're just kind of restarting a kernel, starting with some new ideas, uh, hoping that we'll implement a little bit better code than I previously have. Uh, so that's what we're leveraging. We're just, it's basically a rewrite of things that I've previously done that have been massively successful. Um, yeah, so that's about it. <laughs> that's what we're doing. So, what we need to do is we need to make a serialize. And this will take a self and it will write to an mutable reference uh, buffer, mutable vector of U8s. And this will, uh, here, parse a DHP option from a raw message, updating the message pointer if the, um, updating the message pointer to reflect the uh, number of parsed bytes. Okay. So we do that. Technically, we could only do that at the end. We're actually going to return something. We're going to do that. Let ret is equal to this. Um, update this. At this point, we know that we're going to return a sum. Update the pointer and ret. Okay, so now we'll only update that pointer when we actually consume it, which is good. All right, this will uh, serialize a DHCP option by appending it to buffer. So here we can match self and we'll have a DHP option. And we just have to do the inverse of what we just did up here. So subnet mask and we'll grab this so we can reference everything that we just did. Subnet mask, mask, buffer, extend from slice mask to big Indian bytes. Okay, then we have a broadcast address. Extend that shit out. Uh, we'll say adder. Adder. Time. Time. This is the lease time. This is a message type. Type. Uh, type as U8. Okay. Then we have a renewal time. We have an unknown. Whoops. Unknown payload. Ah, fuck. We need the lengths of all these things. Whoops. Whoops. Um, uh, 
Uh, no wonder you're able to move so damn fast. You've done this a lot before. Yeah, I have done this a lot before. Any participation in Redox? No, nah, I don't work on any open source projects right now. Or I haven't before. I don't plan to either, really. I like flying solo. Programming is where I go to relax, not not work. And I think uh, working on teams is typically work to, to me. To me. I understand that's very selfish. Uh, but it's how I, how I think. We're going to push... Um, we're going to do len uh, buffer.push. Oh, yeah, we need to know the option type, too, here. Shit. Oh, okay, so we can do this. Buffer.push. This is a... Subnet mask is a... One. So that is the... I mean, I can... Fuck. There's not a great way to do this, but that's the size, right? And then this is for a for a broadcast address. This is a 28, four bytes in length. This is an address. Um, this is pushing a 51, four bytes, which is the least time. Message type, we're pushing a buffer.push a 53. Buffer.push one byte for the option. Renewal time is the same thing as this. Then we have an unknown. Got some curlies we got to put in here, some curly cues. Got a lot of curly cues we're missing. Uh... Least time 51, renewal time is a 58, unknown is a um, type payload.len try into unwrap. So that'll attempt to push that, and then we extend from slice time, time, address, mask. And then DHP option end. This one will do buffer dot push OXFF. Type. Ah, uh, yeah, we'll ref that. Oh, we can't ref it in that spot. We'll just deref it here. Time 161. Not found in scope. Yeah, what are we doing here? This is actually payload. Type is U8. What? Oh, uh, type as U8. I think we still have to deref it. Yeah, because that is a message type. Casting a message type to a U8. Oh, we got to put that in friends. Shit. What? 151. Oh! Deref that type. I think this one was fine. Alright, 156, and then ref that time. Okay. Woo! Fix it. Renewal time, 58. Message type, 53. Lease time, 51. Broadcast address, 28. Subnet mask, 1. And then we have no... We don't have... Message type doesn't implement copy. Problem solved. Okay, and then we'll also do a partial EQ and EQ so we can compare it. Man, I wouldn't even know where to start with building my own OS. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I'm just relatively used to it at this point, but it's not definitely not a common thing that people do. I don't know. There's There aren't really many good ways of getting into it other than having someone kind of show you the ropes. Uh, options. And here we'll do a DHP option message type. Message type 
discover that serialize into options. And then we'll do DHCP option message uh, parameter request list. And these will have the parameters that we request, OX10 or whatever, dot serialize mute options, DHCP option end dot serialize to mute options. And the parameter list, we gave it uh, just a one currently. And here we have the parameter request list. All right, so we got to implement this. This is 55, which puts it right after message type. Parameter request list. So we'll take an a ref u8, all the parameters that we want. Here we'll grab the pram to request list, and this will just be the payload. Yeah. Yeah, that'll literally just be the payload, 272. Copy from slice options. Yeah, I'll borrow that. Okay, and then 136, we gotta make the serialize for it. This is after message type. DCP option, parameter, request list, payload, and this is actually gonna look very similar to this, oops. Uh, payload, and these are parameters. Here we do parameters. And in this case, the parameter request list is a, what, 55? Push a 55, extend from slice the payload, or parameters. Okay. Um, and the length is of the following, yes, perfect. So this should be at parity of what we had before. Yep, we got a DHCP discover and we have a parameter list and we have message type. So now we're using our stuff to uh, construct, yeah, construct the DHCP options for the discover. Um. Can't believe you wrote Fulgurvisor in all assembly. It seems so difficult, even in a high level language. I don't know. I mean, Fulgurvisor did a lot less. It had, what did it have? It had a, I guess it had, uh, it had a 10 gigabit NIC. I don't know. We could look. Um, uh, let's see. I don't think it was that much code, to be honest. I don't know a good way of seeing lines of code. I can't imagine it's more than like a couple thousand lines of code. It's probably like 5,000 lines of code. But here's the like X540 driver I wrote, right? So it's the same shit that we're doing right here. And setting up the, the filters for all these things. In fact, this used a different networking model where I would have each core would get their own um, each core would get their own queue on the network card, so they wouldn't have to lock. And then we set up all the queues in it, RX and TX. And then for UDP, I had a hard-coded template. I actually didn't use DHCP. Uh, everything was fixed addresses, fixed, uh, uh, fixed MAC addresses. So I would only use the, like, it would only work on one machine because I hard-coded the MAC address. I wouldn't even, like, detect that. So that's how I saved a lot of time in, in making this a lot easier to write, is I, I basically heavily restricted the things that I actually did. So we're making this a much higher level, better implementation uh, that can handle a little bit more uh, parameters and options. So, okay, initialize a packet for, uh, for a UDP uh, DHCP packet. 
get access to the header portion of the payload, cast it, inner slice to all zeros, and then we're gonna fill in all of these fields. Um, create the, or fill in part of the request that we care about. And quite frankly, I think this code we can dupe Yeah, so this will be uh, fn create DHP packets. And we'll have a packet, oops, packet, which is a mutable reference to a packet. This will then fill in that packet. So we'll create that, fill in all these fields, copy in our hardware address, um, Mac. So this is our Mac address for ourselves, let's copy in from Mac. And then here, so we allocate a packet from the device. Um, oh, and we wanna pass this options. Same shit as up here. So I'll pass this a list of options. And this will just be a slice of U8. Those will be appended to the packet. Get access to the options. Fill that shit in. So then here we can do pack uh, create DHP packet. We'll provide it our MAC address. Give it a mutable reference to the packet. And we'll do this. Mute packet MAC address followed by the options. Okay, and then we'll send the packet. So this is uh, send the... Uh, DHP discover and this will be uh, create a DHP packet for sending a, a DHP request packet and we have to take a MAC address as the second parameter okay I think that's better 229 MAC address here and I'm pretty sure we can accept with the broadcast so we might be able to cut down on that a bit. Uh, we'll take a zid as well, which is the uh, unique identifier. It's like the uh, session identifier effectively. So we'll pass in the zid. Okay, then here we're going to uh, wait for the DHCP offer and then parse the DHCP packet, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Hey, Myla, how are you doing? Lord Dankington. Wait, did you get partnered? I, said, I see more quality options. I'm not partnered yet, but I have had a high enough number of viewers that it's gotten that all sorted out. So, it's kind of based on demand and load, I think, on their end. How do you copy pasta efficiently? I use like all the different clipboards. I'll like select the console clipboard for some lines. I'll do like a visual select for others. It, I kind of use like a couple different ways of doing copies and pastes. So I definitely, I, I definitely use like three different ways of copying and pasting while I'm developing. And it really just depends on what I think is gonna work best, which is kind of weird. Uh, 261 options there we go copy the options in and then we send the packet okay so now we're gonna wait for the offer now we want to do this with a timeout and here we're gonna say uh, make sure the packet was destined for us if it wasn't then psh, throw it in the trash and we're gonna parse the DHCP packet and this is gonna be if let sum this is a header and options is equal to this. Um, so this is parse the DTP packets. Then we're gonna get the header and the options. If it matches our zid, then this is a this is definitely what we were getting. So we'll say print got DTP response this, and we'll say we'll just print the options for now. We'll actually just panic this shit. Get the hell out of here with a panic. All right, so this should print the reply that we're getting from DHCP. Oh, index starts uh, 129. Mm. 
Oh, on the end condition. Uh, return. Return end sum end. That's a special case. Return out early. Okay, here we go. This will send the request and we'll get the response when it... Okay, there we go. So we got a response, which is an offer with lease time 3,600, renewal time 1,800, subnet mask and our broadcast address. So we'll know uh, what we can communicate for those. And then we have to send that a... Uh, we'll send it back, um, I think a request. Yeah, we send it a request. Everything's zeroed out still. We still can broadcast that, so we're going to do the same thing. So we'll break out once we get that, which is not its not done yet, but we're just ballparking it. Um, in fact, we can, yeah, so this is going to send the DHCP request. Wait for the DHCP ACK. And this is the end of the DHCP um, procedure, effectively. But I don't want to put too much investment into this code because we're going to change this up. Uh, here we'll do options clear. Oops. Uh, Options.clear. This is create options for the request. Here we're going to request. That's it. I think we literally just do the request and, oh, we'll need to supply a, a requested address. DHCP option requested. And this is the address that it potentially gave us. And do we need the server? I don't know if we do. I don't think so. Um, I mean, we can grab it if we need it, but all right, let's just send this request and see what happens. We're not actually filling anything in, so this is going to be pretty borked. Um, okay. Do we allocate a new packet? Yes, we do. Okay, I was about to say, how are we going to unpack it? Uh, we fill that in, and that returns end. Okay. Yeah, so we, sent, we get the offer, and oh, we're panicking. Silly. Rust is literally telling us that. Here we're gonna break from our loop. We, we need to add timeouts and a bunch of stuff to make this more resilient, and we'll do that in a second. Okay, got a DHCP response. And we then send a request, and then it knacks us. Uh, and that makes sense. <laughs> Message, wrong network. Okay, so we'll send a request, and then we'll, yeah, I guess we'll include that server IP in there as well. <clears throat> what is this project about? We're writing a uh, custom kernel and bootloader in Rust uh, and a hypervisor once we get to the hypervisor port point of things. Um, but yeah, this is effectively so that we can do a bunch of different uh, research and use it to find bugs in processors as well as software. So, and of course, a lot of learning and just a lot of fun. <laughs> Writing hypervisors is, is just a lot of fun at the end of the day. Or I guess we're writing a kernel right now. We're not even at the hypervisor part. We're working on a, today we're working on a network stack. So we're writing a DHCP client that'll allow us to dynamically get an address uh, for whatever we want to use. So we're going to parse, we got to add the 50 option. And these are easy. Uh... Sat 50 before lease time. Requested IP. I'll be a U32. And then we want the server IP. Uh, used in offer and request messages may optionally be included in that. Include this in an offer to allow the client to distinguish between lease offers. Okay. So, yeah, we'll pass that. And that is the uh, server. We'll just say server IP. Technically, the server identifier. But, okay. So, for 50, this is going to be a uh, requested IP. 
And then for 54, this is the server IP. Okay, and then down here, we're going to do the same shit. Uh, here we go. Here's one that's four bytes. This will be the server IP. This is at 54, I think. Right? Yeah. 54.4, and this will write the address. And then... Uh, before message type, we send... Uh, actually, it's before least time, isn't it? This is a 50. This is the requested. Request IP, I think I called it. Requested. Nice. Requested is better, in my opinion. So requested IP is 50. Okay. So now we will be able to extend this with a DHP option. Uh, requested IP. And this will be the offer. So we'll say for option in options. I guess we were going to search for a specific option. It's a good way to do that. Um, I think we'll say if options.iter.any x is 5. It's not valid, but we're just going to say that. Okay. Sweet. DHP options. So we're going to say if any where this is a DHP option where X is a, if any of them are a DHCP option, message type, message type um, offer. So basically, check for an offer. Oop, barely fit there. And then this is gonna be got a DHCP offer. I think we're off on some prints here. Nice. X, and we might have to ref that. Uh, 287. Do I have some code that I'm working on in another spot? Did I accidentally delete some code there? I don't think so. Somewhere I fucked something up pretty good. 328. Okay, down up here. Oh, yeah. Let's get rid of that. Nice. Okay, requested IP. We'll comment that out for now. And then here, if any of them, any of the options were an offer, then we know that we have an offer at this point. Uh, we'll ref that so we can do that comparison. And then we'll print. Got a response. We've got to implement partial EQ on these. That'll allow us to compare these. Okay, so if, if we found an offer, then we'll go through options, and we're going to extract the information we care about. Um, let's mute offer IP is none, let mute server IP is none, let mute broadcast IP is none, let mute, what else do we parse out of there that we care about? Um, least time, renewal time, subnet mask is none. Okay, so at this stage we can say Offer IP is equal to header your address. Uh, so we're going to say do that and then break. All right. Uh, check to see if this is a DHP offer. And then we got an offer. Save off information from the packets. So we're going to say the offer IP is from your address. The server IP should be filled in at this point, so we should be able to grab the... Uh, actually, 54 is the server IP. 
Yo, buddy. Okay, so we're gonna say for option and options uh, server if or will match the option. And if it's a DHP option server IP, I'm starting to get scoped in here pretty bad. If it's a server IP, then we'll do server IP is some adder. Fuck. Just barely don't fit. Uh, everything else will do nothing. And then doesn't know the types for any of these, so we'll have the broadcast IP. And let's save the broadcast. Okay. Uh, broadcast. Broadcast address. Yeah, we're going to change uh, broadcast address to broadcast IP. Okay, and then 308 subnet mask. That one we literally call subnet mask. So that's easy. Subnet mask. Then we'll do subnet mask. All right. Noise. Would it be possible to build a hypervisor for iOS? Yeah, absolutely. It'd be a lot of work, but you could do it. You probably need a jailbreak. I spent two hours looking for my phone. It's on my bed the whole time. Fuck. Imagine walking into a job interview and you boot your own kernel. <laughs> yeah. I recently discovered your channel, but it, uh, but I'm enjoying it. Also, good background noise when working from home. Hell yeah. It's exactly what we're here for. It's just a little bit of good background noise. All right, so we parse out all the things we care about. Uh, this is uh, things we hope to maybe find in a DSP offer. And then we will say requested IP is equal to, uh, and then here we can say let offer IP is equal to offer. And then let server IP is equal to server IP. Uh, attempt to get the uh, the offer IP and server IP because these are kind of required for this stage. And then we'll do offer IP serialize mute options. Then we'll do a server IP. Pass this the server IP. We'll just let it know what server we're talking to. Uh, oh, this function get lease option. And then at the end, it'll return if we get a lease. Can't technically hit that part of the code, but it doesn't matter. So this will now send a request. And here's our request. And up. Oh, I got a 2BE that shit. Actually, any place that I'm serializing. Two big Indian bytes. Uh, question mark? From big Indian bytes. Oh, you know what? That's just for the your address. Yeah, that makes sense. Because this needs to be from uh, to Big Indian. Uh, yeah, we can actually do that. To Little Indian. Uh, we'll do from BE. It's more clear. U32 from Big Indian. All right, so this is now correct. So this will now send a request, and we should get an ACK. So there's the discover. There's the offer. Here's our request. We're saying, I would like this IP. And then it acknowledges that that is the IP that we got. Woo! Woo! We did it. And there we go. We got a 
got response ack, which is basically the game over message. And I guess we care about the least time and renewal time at this stage. Uh, broadcast and subnet mask. Yeah, we'll grab those. All right. So here we're going to see if any of them are... Check if this is DHP ack. Ack. Then uh, we know that we got our ack and we can break out of this whole loop. Okay. So this will only print on an ack and then we'll save off the rest of the information. Subnet mask, broadcast IP. We'll grab all of these in a similar way up here. Yoink, paste. And the only thing that we'll actually parse is the server IP in this stage. And then at this stage, we'll parse out the broadcast IP and the subnet mask. Okay, let's see what we got here. Whoops. All right, so now we'll parse out. So we'll get the offer IP, server IP. Then at this point, um, things we hope to get from the DTP ACK. Capitalize this. And then once we get an ACK, we can return out that we got a lease. And we'll store this information. And what else do we care about? Up here, I don't think I need a parameter request list. Yeah, so I think I'll make a, I'll make one of these bad boys. Enum, DHP option, ID, repper, U8. And these are the uh, DHP options to their IDs. And this will have subnet mask is equal to, and then we're just gonna go through all of these and make sure they match. So subnet mask, broadcast IP, uh, requested IP, lease time, lease time, lease time, uh, message type, server IP, um, parameter request list. Renewal time, 58, and then end. Okay, I think that's everything. And then down here, we'll change these to use uh, DHP option type. I think that's what I called it, right? DHP option ID. And this is subnet mask. Okay. And I'll double check these as we go. Broadcast IP is 28. And we as you ate all of these. Should have done this from the start. But 28 broadcast IP, requested IP. So I'm checking these. Every time I replace them, I'm making sure that the ID matches and this is least time. Uh, oops, paste. This is a message type. Got a 54, the server IP. Parameter request list. Okay, we got the renewal time. Oops. Oops. Renewal time, unknown is the bytes just included, and then end, we have the end. Perfect, first fucking try, no problems. We'll format this to not look like shit. All right, and then, we're gonna have to calibrate our timer on the system. So 
such that we can start implementing timeouts, and then we're also going to have to have a way of putting these packets back onto the network device. So I think we're going to probably make a structure or something that holds a box network device. So we'll see what we do for that. Hardcode mode, wrap this kernel into Discord bot. <laughs> boot into <laughs> to boot it within a post embed. <laughs> Uh, when you're writing your own curl, kernel, what OS do you compile for? I compile for uh, Windows MSVC. All right. So here we're going to wait for that. And then here, this is for the discover. And for discover, we want... Uh, requested parameter list, parameter list, and we'll give this a reference serialize mute options. So we're going to tell this that we really would like a DHCP option ID. So we would like to get a server IP, and that's it. That's the only option. Well, message type and server IP. So we are requesting that we want a message type and a server IP, so we should be able to get a server IP. And what's this complaining about here? On requested parameter list? What is it? Parameter request list. Ugh. All right. So we say that we want those things, and then down here, we will include a requested list, and we would like a message type. We would also like a broadcast IP, and we'd love to get a subnet mask too. And if you can get me all of those things, then I'll be happy. That means we can fill those in, and at the end, we can return a lease sum lease and we'll have the oops we're gonna have the client IP uh, and what's this I think yeah this is the request IP no it's not the request IP it is the offer IP server IP, so we'll save that, broadcast IP, and subnet mask, so we'll get a lease with all of these things, okay, and then we'll do pub struct lease, this will have a pub client IP, pub server IP, pub broadcast IP and subnet mask option U32. So some of these we might not have gotten. Those ones we don't, we don't really need to tear the whole thing down if we can't get those. We can probably make do without some of those. And then uh, expected a lease from this. Yeah, this gives a lease on success. So on success, we return a lease, and then we can implement debug for that. Okay, and that means in my test code, where I get a lease, uh, oh, we did that in E1000. Get a lease, let lease is equal to this, and we can now pretty print that lease. All right, let's see what we got. And we got a lease, client IP, server IP, broadcast IP, subnet mask. So we got all those options. Nice. Okay, so we need to implement timeouts for our receives. And we also need to implement um, 
filtering on these receives. Basically, if we filter a packet, we need to actually put it somewhere in storage. Um, and that's going to be on net device. So we're going to re-architect a decent amount of how all of this shit works, which I'm not looking forward to. Windows MSVC. <laughs> so we're going to have a Windows subsystem for Rust. Now this is... Um, I just use that for the MSVC calling convention. So it doesn't have red zones, so I can use standard libraries with it. Oh, putting an elf is pretty awful, unfortunately. You have to you have to build like a whole new Rust tool chain and everything for it to work. It's just stupid. All right. So what we need to do is we need to make net device actually have that's where you like bind. So you'll make a net you'll get access to a net device, you'll bind to it. That'll give you a bind reference. Yeah. I think yeah, this is gonna be like a struct net device, I think. Well, we're going to have a trait net device. Um, I guess it'll be like net driver or something like that. Net driver. Oh, we're going to have so much code to change. Okay, we're going to have a struct net device. This is going to... This is going to be um, an implementation for a network device. This holds uh, packet queues and has an underlying driver to send and receive from. So this will have driver, which will be a box dyn dispatch of a net driver. And then can we impl for probe? So probe we just return a device. Impl device. So we'll want to implement purge, I think, here. So we're going to have the driver, which is the network driver. That's going to be this. And then we're going to have queues and stuff that we store in here, which is like number of packets for uh, bind. So someone will bind to a port, and then we'll be able to receive directly on that port. Um, fuck. And that device will end up in a global structure, I think, in place of... Yeah, we're refactoring so much of this code. Um, a net device will have a driver. This will have the queues. And this net device will have to go in the device list, which means it has to impl device. And impl device just has to implement net device, which we don't have to do anymore because we'll be able to downgrade to a net driver. So we're going to get rid of that trait, and that is on SP kernel source PCI. So this is our PCI enumeration. Go through all of these. Looks good. Debug PCI devices. We'll keep that. Purge. Um, and it's a device that implements any. And we won't impl device on that. We'll just put this into net. It's for net device. Okay. N this is for net device. Okay. Net device is a private struct. Yep, right now it is. Um, 
I guess it will need to be public anyways. We'll have purge. Unimplemented purge for net device. Now we have a net driver. Fuck yeah. So this will pull in. This actually isn't gonna be too bad. Use crate PCI. As with all refactorings, it's really just a matter of time. Uh, basically every single place that we use this in the driver percent as net device with net driver. So we're now implementing a network driver. Um, okay. Got some issues. We don't have box. All right, let's grab box. Uh, use, use alloc boxed box. Okay. Yeah, because that could be generic. That makes sense. So that does need to be on a box. 14 on net. Yes, this is... Um, you got to do the same thing in here. S net device, net driver. Oh, yeah, we're fucking close now. Um, DHPRS. This takes a... That will take a net device. Mutable reference to a network device. Yeah, and I don't necessarily want that to be mute. Ugh, fuck. We're gonna have to change all of this stuff to use like internal locks, but we can say this will be a net driver or a net device. 309 takes a mutable reference to a net device. Okay. And then that, yeah, I guess we can manage the packets now. We can allocate our own packets and then send will pass through. Okay. Yeah, a lot of refactoring here. Uh, allocate packet and release packet is going to be moved into the net device, which is much better. Um, this will allocate a packet from the net devices free list. And this is, uh, a release a packet back to the net devices, uh, free list. Okay. Then we're going to take the code that we allocate packet here. Basically, that is literally what we want here. Yoink, paste, yoink, paste. We're getting there. It's all coming together. Just very slowly. Um, free packets. Free list of packets. Packets. Delete this. Then here, packets, free list of packets, uh, pub fn new. Oh, that's impl device. Yeah, okay. This is impl net device. Allocate and release packets. Then we can net device here, 382. Okay. So we have that free list. We'll have to implement new for this. We'll get to that. Allocate packet, uh, make this pub. All right, 3d4 send. We're going to have uh, receive, no receive. Okay. So we're going to implement um, impl net driver for net device. 
And this is easy. Sell uh net driver. And we just have to do max send receive. Um I think I have to do these wrappers. I mean, I can get access to the driver. Yeah, we're gonna do this. So make that pub. And then on DTP, device dot driver. Get the MAC address for the driver. Driver, driver, driver. Oh, no, not driver on that. You gotta fix one of those up. Uh, one of those we put a driver where we weren't supposed to on allocate packet. There we go. Okay, E1000 errors now. Sweet. 373, release packet. Ooh. An E1000. Um, fuck. Do I need to put the free list on the dryer so this can have access to it? I can do a packet lease here. That'll return out a packet lease. New self packet. Ooh. Ooh. I might have to have allocate packet on the driver. Which is okay. What are you using for streaming? Uh, just OBS. All right, we'll put the free list back onto there. Uh, release packet, and then I I want that description back. These, yoink. Brrrr. Net driver has these, and then these we will we want to have a free list. Free list will be put onto the driver. Uh, get lease on a nick. Okay, allocate packets. Not found on device. Driver allocate packet. Driver allocate packet. Okay, so we need to box this up. Yep, device not implemented for Intel Gbit. That is true. So here we have to implement uh, pub. My Vim config is default. It's just pretty much all the Vim defaults. We're going to pub fn new. This will take a driver, which is a box dyn net driver. This will return a self, and it'll do net device driver. And that's it. So this will uh, wrap up a driver in a net device. Okay. 36, E1000. Yes. So this will be net device new box new this. And we got to pull in net device. Okay, uh, 279, E1000, expected net device, found a nick. Yeah, so 
36 expected box. Oh yeah, we gotta box that shit up. You know what, this is fine. This, this. Tab this in. Hey, we can build again. Okay. Woof. PCI doesn't require a net device anymore. Woo, we did it. We did it. Still alive, slept for nine hours, hell yeah. Hope you had some good sleeps. Um, all right. We gotta get this final plumbing in. We're in the home stretch. So fucking close. Gotta, gotta stay focused. Um. I think I'm gonna try and get a lease when I make a net device. Yeah, we'll make this. Let me device is equal to this. Here we'll try and get a lease off of this device. And then we'll return a uh, device. Okay, so this will now run that DTP code again. There we go. We got a delete a uh, lease. Yo buddy, we got a lease. Broadcast IPs, a subnet mask. Okay, now what this means is since we're using a device now, we're gonna make a we're not gonna expose driver. This is a driver that provides raw send uh, RX and TX. TX to the network. Okay. Um, and we'll do pub fn allocate packet. Mute self, return a packet. Um, this will allocate a new pa packet for use. Um, this will do self dot driver dot allocate packet. Then these won't call driver anymore for allocating packets. Doop doop doop. Okay, private field for the MAC address. Yeah, we can do that. MAC address, we can just, we're just gonna extract that. U8, this is the MAC address for the network card. And that will be, MAC will be from driver.mac. So we'll cache the MAC early. And we can make that Mm, we don't want that mute. Uh, pub fn mac self returns the u86 self dot mac uh, gets the mac address for this network device. Okay, driver dot mac. This becomes dot mac. I think that's the only spot where we did that. All right. Now we don't have access to send and receive. And that's great because we want to wrap send and receive ourselves. We will access the network driver. Uh, yeah, we're going to directly access the network driver. And then if the network driver... So we're going to have... Um, Wow, we're gonna have uh, EDP binds. Is that a B tree map from a U16 to a vector of packets? Yeah, so this is um, packet queues for. Kind of, it's kind of weird, but yeah, we do have to do this. We have to do packet queues for EDP uh, ports for bound EDP ports. So, 
so packet keys for bound UDP ports. Um, if a so this will be someone will call bind that'll create a new bind. We'll give out a lease to a bind. Packet keys for UDP ports for bound UDP ports. So we're gonna take away access to raw networking by doing this, which is good. Um, and this is when packets are parsed and they're valid UDP packets to existing existing bound uh, EDP ports. And they're valid EDP packets to existing bound EDP ports. Uh, we will return the, uh, we will store the packets in these lists. So when packets are parsed and they're valid EDP packets to existing bound EDP ports, we'll store the packets in these lists. So now we get into the like kind of hard shit. So use alloc vec vec, use alloc collections b tree map okay so when someone wants to do udp they will bind for udp packets and they'll accept broadcasts because we won't bind on an ip we'll just literally bind on a port and when a desk port for a packet is one of these ports, we will just put the packet there, and the device can handle broadcast to that. So by default, broadcast will be handled. Okay, so I think what we'll do is... Um, we'll do pub struct... Um, so this is going to be a guard, or this is like a bind port. It's gonna have an A ref to a device, and this is an A mute ref to a net device. This is the reference to the network device we are a bind on. We are bound to. Uh, this is a UDP bind. Yeah, we'll say UDP bind. Reference to the network device we are bound on. Okay, and then we'll have a port, uh, port we are bound to, and this is a uh, UDP bound uh, port, okay, and then uh, I'm going to make this pub temporarily just so we can build this. So we can start doing some testing. But UDP binds is going to be uh, B tree map new. So an empty B tree. Okay. And this will just allow us to bind to something. And then we'll call receive on the UDP bind, I think. So we'll get a net device, and then we'll call bind on that. <sighs> Fuck. I think we're going to want to arc that. I don't think I want these mutes, because I don't want to have to have a net device open. I think... I don't know if I want to do internal mutability to net device. I think I do. I think basically anything I call on net device, I want to be non-mute. Hello, my favorite kernel developer. What's up, Toby Meister? How you doing? All right, we're going to do it with mutable for now. We'll relax mute next stream. Probably, um, but we're going to get this working. So we're going to bind a port. When we bind a port, that will put a UDP bind in here. So we'll do uh, pub fn bind mute self. This will give a UDP bind, uh, bind UDP. Port u16, uh, bind to listen for all messages 
all UDP packets destined to port. Okay. This will give a UDP bind with a lifetime A. Uh, that's inferred. Uh, we gotta we gotta do the same thing. We're gonna have A where B for A, and then this is for B, and this is A. So B outlives A. Oh, this is B. That's the weaker one. So B outlives A. This lives for B. This lives for A. So we're gonna give a temporary lease, and we'll give a UDP bind to, we'll give access to the device, which is our self, and then the port, we'll just set the port, and this will return an option, because there's a chance that someone else is already bound on that, in which case we will say, um, self.udpbinds.insert, uh, actually, if self.udp binds contains port, if it does not contain the port, then we'll return a, then we'll insert it, self.udp binds.insert uh, dot push. Is this the way that I actually want to do it? Never thought your editor scheme could be so comfy. Oh yeah, it feels so good in here. It's nice and warm, roasty toasty. We're gonna push. We're gonna insert for ports a vec new. That's where we hold packets. We'll return a UDP bind, otherwise we'll return none. Okay, um, if this contains the key, so this is, uh, check to if, check to see if someone already is listening on this port. This is, uh, nobody is listening, allocate a new, uh, bind queue, and this is return out the bound, uh, return out the bound access the UDP bind, and then this is um, somebody, someone already is bound to this port. Holy shit. Now, we can call bind UDP somewhere. Let's do it here. So I should be able to do, let, UDP is equal to device.bind UDP for 50. So I can unbind on UDP, UDP port 50, and I shouldn't be able to do another bind, and that's the biggest issue. Well, that'll actually shadow the other UDP 2. This should. Um, yeah, that's getting non-lexical lifetimed, so we are going to have problems with this, but anyways, this is going to return a reference. We want to change a lot of these to not be mutable uh, shortly, but for now, this will bind on UDP, and then I'll, I want to do UDP.receive, and this will give me... Um... Fuck. So we're gonna impl UDP bind FN receive. This takes a mute self. It's going to give a mm. Yeah, we're gonna have to start sprinkling locks in here, and I I don't like that. I fucking hate locks. But we're gonna need them, unfortunately. We're gonna try and put the locks as as localized as we possibly can. So receive, this is going to give a,
is going to give a reference to a packet similar to what we have to do before. This is going to be in A, B outlives A. This is B. We're going to give a reference to the contents of the packet that was received. So we'll start with this. Oh, it doesn't need to be a tuple. And then here, oh, we'll do an option. Once again, non-blocking. Everything's non-blocking here. So we can return none. Okay, and then here we'll do uh, unwrap. Make sure that we are actually able to bind there. Now we have indicate the anonymous lifetime and UD UDP bind. Ah, so yeah, self lives for A. Um, okay, so we'll have B, and we'll A outlives B, and this is B, and this is A, it should be, because that's the, uh, oh yeah, we can't, well, that's the ref to the net device, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna make some new shit, we're gonna have C, B outlives C. This lives for C, or this lives for B. This, fuck yeah, 62, make that mute. Oh, we're doing some lifetimes now. Okay, so that's gonna receive a UDP packet. So we're gonna print. All right. And then this will call self dot device receive EDP. This can be pub. We're going to receive UDP on a port. This will give us access to the packet uh, self dot port. So we're going to request. All right, now we implement receive EDP. FN receive EDP, mute self, uh, receive a EDP packet. Sending's always gonna go all the way through, so we'll still want allocate packet and stuff. Um, and this is going to return, this is gonna take a port destined to a specific port. Let's take a U16, turn an option. You gotta do the lifetime shit here. Uh, a, B, outlives A, this is B. This is gonna return an A ref, A ref U8s. Okay, none should work here. Nice, we've plumbed it. So now, we want to receive a raw packet and then parse it as UDP. Um, device driver receive. So this is going to get a packet. So this will uh, receive a packet. Um, it could be any raw packet. Then we're going to... If... Um, if let sum EDP is equal to packet.edp, uh, attempt to parse the packets as EDP, uh, packet was EDP, else we can do this, print dropped non EDP packets here, and we'll just print the contents of that. Okay, O2X, and this will be packet.raw. So we'll basically drop non-UDP packets. That's actually where we're gonna handle ARPs. Um, and then packet was UDP at this stage. Device 91 in net. Uh, oh, self. Driver. Okay, receive a packet. 
packet not found on packet lease. Oh, yeah, here we're going to do, um, if we didn't have a packet, then we return none. So we're going to attempt to get a packet. If we could get a packet, we're going to try and parse it as UDP. If we couldn't parse it as UDP, we're going to drop that packet and return, we're going to print that we dropped a non-UDP packet. Otherwise, the packet was UDP. If UDP dot dest port is equal to port, then we're going to actually return. Oh, this might return the packet. Yeah, we're just going to return the packet. And then that actually relaxes a lot of these. Maybe. This is actually a packet lease. Fuck. Um, and this is the... Yeah, we do want to parse the UDP part of that. I could do a closure. I want to be able to reuse that parsed UDP packet. Fuck. Well, I have that packet lease. Oh my god. So we got a packet lease. The packet lease lives for A. Which references the network device that own the network driver that owns it. Holy shit! Um, the packet lease is gonna live for A. We have to give it ownership of the packet. We also can get the bytes, which will live for A, which is the restricted lifetime from here. We'll say we have an A. We have a B which outlives A, and in this case we have a, we have a B, that will return an A, otherwise we'll return none, that'll cause the packet lease to get dropped, so we'll return the packet lease, and then we'll return the UDP, honestly, we can just do that, we'll have a UDP refs, yeah, We'll have a UDP, which also lives for A, because it's referencing the packet lease. Holy shit, we're doing lifetimes, else none. Uh, this was, wasn't was for us. Drop it. We're actually not going to do that. That'll put it up back in the queue. 28, receive. Ugh. This will return the packet lease for C and a UDP for C. So it's the parsed UDP, so we don't have to reparse it, right? So we're trying to store that parse information, and we're trying not to copy anything here. Um, oh, 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 holy shit, it's gonna work. Let Packet, so that's the raw packet. This is the UDP parse packet. Uh, U UDP packet is equal to UDP.receive. Holy fuck. UPP. Fuck, 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 fuck. Uh, unwrap. Oh, um, if let some. So we're going to attempt to receive a packet, which is non blocking. Then we're going to print the UDP packet that was destined for port 50. Oh, now we got the lifetimes. Okay. Now we got the lifetimes. Doesn't live long enough. Uh, let's see if we can bind it. Let's see if we can do this. Basic case. Let's see if it's our fault in how we're using it. And it is not. So we got a problem at 101. Packy EDP. What language is this? This is all in Rust. Packet is borrowed here. Um, cannot return a value referencing a local packet. Packet. Packet is borrowed here. Well, it is.
Return to value referencing data owned by the current function. But we move the packet out. Move out a packet happens here. Returning this value requires that packet is borrowed for A. Packet is borrowed here. That's true. Packet EDP. Borrow that for A. Turns a value. Okay, what's the what's the problem? Because we might drop that, but this is the return of the function. That's the end. Um. Because we give the packet, returns a value referencing data owned by the packet, which is there. Fuck. I don't think Rust is smart enough to see. Where a packet occurs here, move out a packet happens here. Returning this value requires that packet is borrowed for A. We borrow it. I think if I change this to use a map potentially, I might be able to make this work. Um, right? Uh, get the packet. We parse it as UDP. But I, I feel like this turns value everything data owned by the current function because it's currently borrowed because it doesn't see that I'm also moving UDP out. Is there no way for me to do this in Rust? Move out a packet here. Good morning, Desu. Borrow out a packet happens here. Lifetime A here. Borrow out a packet occurs here. Move out a packet happens here. Returning this value requires that packet is borrowed for A. And A is the lifetime of this function. And A is not borrowed for the lifetime of the function. Resident Cargo Clippy here, what's the question? We're trying to do some weird borrows. We want to return... Oh, do I need another? I think I actually need to do... C? Where A outlives C? But that's a function scope. Oh, whoops. No, we want C, which outlives A. A, B, oops, A, C. B outlives A, C outlives A. No, that's not right. Yeah, that's not right. That's not right. Well, yeah, this is tech. This is technically incorrect because pack at least A lives for less time than B, which is true. 
And we need something that... So I think we need a C where A outlives C and B outlives A. So B outlives A and A outlives C. Fuck. Lifetime C defined here. Borrow the packet here. Move out a packet occurs here. Returning this value requires that packet is borrowed for C. I can't do that. Yep. Yup. Yup, 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 yup. We gotta figure that one out. Uh, fuck, that's so... Uh, I don't know if Rust allows this. I actually don't know if this is possible. UDPC, C, A outlives C, B outlives A. What is the type of driver receive? Um, this. This is going to give us a packet. This is a packet lease that lives for A, <clears throat> right? So we, we get a packet lease that, that lives for A. That's what we return. We then borrow off of that packet using UDP. And UDP will return, oh, that's the same lifetime of the packet. Oh, we might need to annotate the lifetime of the packet then. No, the packet lives as long as that. Well, the packet's part of the, the packet lease. The raw packet's owned by that. Yeah, I actually don't think this is necessarily the case. I think this is actually A. So, yeah, I think we can just do A. We got B, A, A. Because, we'll call UDP, if it's sum, I'm going to try, we're going to return none from this function temporarily, and I'm just going to do this quick. I'm going to make sure that this works. We'll add a couple lines at a time. Okay, so that's valid. And here we're going to let UDP is equal to packet.udp. So we're, there we're going to parse the UDP, and let's see if we can do, uh, oh, and that's an option. Let's unwrap that. So this is now a UDP that lives for A. Right? Because the packet lease is A, and the UDP will borrow off of the packet. Oh, is that going to make a new lifetime? Packet is owned by packet lease, which is A. UDP will deref packet lease, because packet lease will deref into the packet, which will give us a ref of the packet for a new anonymous lifetime. Um, requires that packet is borrowed for A. Okay. What if we do a C, where A outlives C, and C is the bitch type? UDP should have a shorter lifetime than the packet lease. Yes, I agree. That's what I'm trying to do, right? Am I missing something? Am I doing something stupid? Check your return type. Well, 
That's what it should be, right? But that doesn't really matter yet. Requires that packet is borrowed for C. But that's not true. Is that because that's getting dereft automatically? I can do packet up packet. UDP not found on packet as ref unwrap. All right. Requires that packet up packet is borrowed for C. I don't think I can prove that with a return, can I? If I'm returning this thing out, I don't know if I can prove that. Fuck. Yeah, because that will call it, that'll call it DREF. So we'll borrow. Packet still packet dropped here while borrowed. If I do core mem drop UDP, is this fine? I should be able to do this, right? No? I mean, that's because I'm strictly annotating that. That's going to make it a B, right? Oh, is it? No, that's going to make a new lifetime. C is the lifetime of this function. No, it, it can be passed in by a caller. Yeah, I don't know if this is possible, man. Don't know if I can do this. Oh, that's going to make me sad. That's going to make me really sad. I can potentially make UDP not reference the packet and have offsets instead, but I don't like that. Like, there, there are definitely solutions to this, but I would like to do this with lifetimes. So I'm actually curious if this is possible, and I don't know if it is. So I'm going to do a fn foo. It's going to take a vector. This is a vector of u8s, and it's going to return a vector of u8s. Okay, that's easy. fn main foo vec oh, u8 30, 32. Okay. So that, that'll work. Um, we'll just return vec. Ah, it's not a... Well, it will become a tuple. So we'll just put it in a tuple. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to return a slice of u8s. And the slice of u8s are from the vector. And this lives for A. Got an A here. What browser is this? This is just Firefox. Part after move here. You can't do this specifically. Oops.
It's borrowed there. Why can't you do this? You can't annotate without a, a reference, I don't think. Yeah. Owned by the current function. Oh, vec plus a. But, uh oh, here comes the shit storm. Oh, it's not a trait. Can't do this because it's invalid. Why is it invalid though? Right? Why is it invalid? Right? I can do this. I can do let foo is equal to vec five eight. Right? Well, I guess because that move. Well, like I can do this. Right? So if I can do this, I also have access to vec. Receiver doesn't have a way to know it's borrowed. Oh. Yeah, and thus it it thinks it can be mutable. Because it, it thinks it's getting full ownership of it, where it's mutable. Fuck. Can I wrap it in a structure? Yeah, I'm returning mutant cons. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Can wrap it in cow. Um... Does cow work here? Oh yeah, wrap wrap the vector in cow. I don't think I can in my my actual environment because I have. The type's not evacuate. It's actually a, a <laughs> it's actually a value that ha has its own reference in its inside of it. So there's a lifetime there. And fuck. So I can use a closure. Do I just make a closure? Because I can use a closure and make this all work. Because then I can do the borrow. Yeah, I think a closure is probably the play here, which is fucking weird. Um, but I think it is. So in this case, so I actually will invoke a closure if a packet was received. And if no packet was received, so we'll return an option to indicate whether a packet was received, and then here we can parse the packet, and then we can invoke a closure on that packet. So at this stage, we can use we can invoke a closure. But yeah, huh? Are there any languages that could express that? Because I feel like that would actually be a really nice thing to be able to express. It's relatively sophisticated, but like, I don't know. All right, so this will take uh, an F, which is FN once, which is nice, because this is truly an FN once. G seed languages, yeah. I mean, you can make Rust a G seed language by wrapping everything in RC ref cell effectively, <laughs> or like cow.
Yeah, so this will invoke funk, which is an F, and we'll call funk, and we'll pass it the packet. We can give it a ref to the packet. So let's take a packet. I don't think I need this explicit typing now because we're not returning anything. So we should be able to get away with anonymous lifetimes now. So we'll call function, that'll take a ref to a packet, and then a ref to a UDP, which has a lifetime, which will be inferred. Okay. This is like ballpark what I wanna do. Uh, receive UDP, blah, blah, blah. Mismatch types, okay. Expected an option. Uh, this will just be the sum case. Um, oh, 104, expected UDP. Yeah, UDP actually, we can move that into there. That's fine, no problem. 30, receive UDP, this will now take a closure, which is gonna be an F, FN once, and we'll, we'll type this in a bit when we figure out what we wanna do. This will take a packet and a UDP. Funk, funk F. This will return an option this. Okay, 64, and now we can get a packet UDP, this, oops, this. Holy shit. While, or loop. If we had a packet destined to us, now we can print the payload of the UDP. EDP dot, I think it's just payload or something. Maybe message, I forgot what I called it. But it, that's an FN once, which is nice. Oops, EDP. Or hex for that. What does a EDP have? Pretty sure it is payload. I guess we can ref it. No, that should be a reference. What, what am I doing here? Oh, question mark. There we go. Woof. I thought it, everything was broken. All right, so this will now print UDP packets that are sent to port 50. So we should be able to do a... Um, receive from and then we'll send a packet to port 50 yeah that's gonna block on that receive so we'll get rid of the block hey okay Nice. So that means we don't have to reparse the packet because we're not returning it out. So we can just say, I want to bind port 50. And if I did port 51, we shouldn't see anything here because we're sending to 50. And that will get dropped. Oh, wee oui, wee. Oui. And now what we're going to do is we're going to bind to UDP. We'll have UDP 50. UDP 51, we're probably not going to be able to have both of these binds active. So we'll do, it's on UDP 50. And this is where, yeah, second, second mutable. So this is where I think I want to start wrapping everything in arcs. 
and making this all work without mute because I want to have two things be able to bind UDP. Back and I want to. I want that to be able to. So in this case, uh, we'll be able to send a fifty. Okay, and then what I want the I want the ability to if I'm not actively receiving. If I receive someone else's packet. I want a way to put that in there. Bind UDP. Yeah, we need to make like all these functions not take mute. And then this will have to take an arc lock cell on net device. Oof. And that won't implement device on it. Because device is purge. So I might have to do it internal. I might have to do it internal such that I can use, so I can pass this, uh, pass this shit around with arcs. Well, this doesn't necessarily need arcs, but it needs to be non-mute. So let's start demoting some of these. This will take self. So UDP bind will call device receive UDP, and this will somehow have to take a self. It'll return none for now, but let's just uh, let's just kind of theory craft how you want to do this. So that actually just works right now, and this no longer this no longer is mute. This should allow us to then do a UDP fifty one. Second mutable borrow. Well, in this case, bind UDP will take a self. Okay. And then UDP binds. We'll have to get access to that. So we'll have to put this in a lock cell. Uh, oof. Oof. I think we'll put this bad boy in an arc lock cell. Yeah, I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back. Oops, sorry. I just <laughs> turned the wrong dial. Be right back. All right, so I got a bowl of cereal here. Pretty hungry. Um, 
Hmm. Okay. Yeah, this stuff ain't too bad. So we'll basically have... We'll have a Loxel on this. Mm. Unless I want to put the packet queue on the UDP bind. Um, no, I can't. So this is actually going to be a VEC DQ. Um, use alloc. I actually don't know where that is. I think it's in collections. VEC DQ. Ah! Is that that? Is that how you fucking spell it? Yes. A6 VEC DQ. All right. So we're gonna make our whole network stack not require mutability. This so we can lock cell. Um. So we got access to lock cell. Um, and then we need another type argument on that, and that comes from uh, kernel source core locals lock cell lock interrupts. It's just a trait. Okay. And we gotta pull that in. Pull in lock interrupts. Use this. Okay, nice. And I think we'll have to lock sell the driver too. Kind of sucks. What are you returning from UDP received? Is it possible to return an own value, or do you really want to want to use a buffer? Uh, UDP receive uh, doesn't return anything. Receive UDP. It just returns whether or not it received anything at this point. Yeah, I wanted to return an owned value that had a lifetime and then a reference to the contents of it. But I couldn't find a good way of doing it. Let's so make a lock cell. B tree map. All right. Now. So return an own value and add a method that gets a reference that returns a reference to the contents. Return an own value. I can't do that because the the contents, the references, are the parsed packet. I don't want to reparse the packet. I already parsed it once. So the closure is just the way to go. 
Th this is all to just avoid reparsing the packet. Because I had to parse it to see whether or not it went to the right port. And I the user is going to want access to the parsed version of the packet anyways. And I don't want them to reparse it if I just did. So we just did a closure. So instead, when you receive, it'll just invoke your closure with your packet with an FN once. And you can get access to the packet and the parsed UDP. Problem solved. I think that works in all all situations. Because an FN once is pretty much a return value in most situations, right? Like, FN once is pretty, pretty weak in terms of its damage to the, like, local environment. Okay, and now we're wrapping everything in locks. Bind UDP. What we're gonna do, let UDP binds is equal to self .udp binds lock. You can't, you pretty much can't do anything bad with FN1. Yeah, exactly. Um, get access to the UDP binds. And then here we can do UDP binds, UDP binds. Turn out the bind. Oh, fuck yeah. Holy shit, does that work? Wait, how is that accessing driver mutably? Dying net driver? Oh, it's because we commented out all this code. So this now needs mutable access to the driver. Now I'll just wrap the driver in a lock. Call it a fucking day. Driver is a lock cell new on that. Um, receive on DHCP. Oh, yeah, that's going to... We can actually just lock for these. Pretty sure. Is that gonna break my references? I think it might. 336 lock. Yeah, we might have to change the way that, I mean, this code, this code is gonna be rewritten to uh, use the new APIs. Allocate packet, a bunch of this shit just needs to be locked now. Mm. Why did I lock sell the MAC address? <laughs> Lock cell new driver. Okay. We're going to get rid of pub and we're going to get rid of DHCP. We'll rewrite DHCP when it's ready. When this new API is ready. But we've got to get this working first. Get rid of vec, we're not using it. Unreachable, who cares? Uh, 107. So here we're gonna let driver is equal to self.driver.lock. Get access to the driver. Uh, and then we'll just do driver.receive. Ooh, is that gonna have lifetime issues? No, because we're doing our call out. 129 lock dot allocate packet. Um oh 107. I think that is it. This should build. Fuck yeah. Okay. 
So now that means I can receive on UDP 50 and I can receive on UDP 51, kind of at the same time. So 251 and 250. Now the problem is right now, they will drop anything. So it's kind of a, yeah, like we're not always gonna see these prints. I think it depends on who wins that race. Yep, so we're losing a lot of packets which is what I would expect. We're losing about 50% of packets, and that's because we're not saving that packet. We're parsing it and discarding it. Oh my god, dude. It's fucking happening. Holy shit. Okay. So... We're going to receive a UDP. If we couldn't get a packet at all, we return none. If we did get a packet, then the... And the destination port match the port that we are expecting a packet on. Then we call your function. And then we return that we were able to successfully get a packet for you. Now, if it wasn't for us, we can do this, print dropping this, and here we can do edp.payload, and we'll just print that for now, and this, we'll be able to see that we're dropping stuff uh, that another, uh, another thing wanted. Yep, we're dropping that, and there we sent it, and here's random shit we're dropping, Dropping that, yeah. So, what we're gonna do here is if, um, yeah, first thing we wanna do, get access to the, um, get access to the uh, UDP binds. Let mute UDP binds is equal to self dot UDP binds dot lock, and then if. If self.port, uh, if let some packets, uh, let ent is equal to UDP binds dot get mute port, ref port. If ent is none, return none. Uh, so this is get access to the UDP uh, queue for this uh, port. This is if there is no port register. Uh, if there is no, honestly, we're just going to panic on that situation. This is not a public function. People can't call this. They can only get access to this through the UDP bind, which validates that that port is created. Okay. Get access to the UDP queue for this port. Then, if ent is not empty, then, um, I kind of want to store that parse packet there. Shit. Hmm. And I can't store that own that reference with the own value. I don't want to reparse it. Similar to async, but not quite async. Fuck. 
fuck. And I can't do the... I can't reference those packets. Well, if it's not empty anyways, um, we'll do let's packet is equal to uh, ent.pop front unwrap. And then here I can do uh, funk ref the packet. We're gonna be dropping it anyways. Is that actually a packet? Did we put a packet in there? Um, yeah, that packet doesn't have access to the net device. It is just a packet. Otherwise, that would need a mutable reference to net driver, which it can't have. Um, okay. Okay. So you got the function. We're going to invoke it on that packet and then uh, packet.udp unwrap and then return some. Okay, and then here we'll we want to do uh, we'll need access to the driver. Get access to the driver as well. So here we're gonna do driver dot. What is it to release a packet? Uh, release packet. L literally release packet. Packet. So we'll give that back to that free list. If. Okay. All right. So get access to the UB UDP pines for this specific port. Um, and we're just gonna scope that. We're gonna say, if the entry is not empty, then we're just gonna pop the last packet that was for that port and we'll reparse it. And then we'll release that packet back and then we'll return that we parse something. Otherwise, We'll attempt to receive an actual packet, and if it was UDP, we'll call the function with that information, and then we want to drop in both these situations. We'll do uh, driver release packet packet. Uh, give the packet back to the driver. Actually, it will do that. In this case, it will because that's a uh, that's reft. So in this case. What I can do wasn't for us. Uh, attempt to save it to an existing bind. So then here we can say uh, UDP binds dot get self or get port dot map x x dot get mute. We're gonna map that. And this one might fail. So we're gonna attempt to get access to this. If we can, we're gonna do x dot push back. And we pop front there. We're gonna push back the packet. And there's a way that we can take that packet out, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, we can do packet dot take. So we're gonna take the packet out, store it in there, and then here we'll have a sum. Uh oh. Oh, packet, lease, take packet. Please, 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 please. <gasps> Fuck ya. Yeah. Wow, so we have to reparse that, which I don't like, but this should work. Uh, if we reset, we should get all of these packets now. Got one. Ooh. Oh yeah, and we're just getting whatever random number. We're not sending any to 51 though, so that's a problem. 
Oh, yeah, this is not the port that we're trying to receive on. This is the actual port. This is the edp.des port. But this should still work. There's nothing here that wouldn't work. So basically, when you receive a UDP packet, we get access to the UDP queues. We get access to the driver. Uh, if we, we check your queue for your port, if it's not empty, then we just grab the packet directly out of there. We reparse it and call your function. And then we release that packet back, return sum, saying that we received something. Otherwise, we receive a raw packet directly from a NIC, from the NIC. If nothing's available, we return out none. Otherwise, we'll parse that packet as UDP. If it didn't parse as UDP, uh, packet was not UDP, drop it. If the packet was not UDP, then we drop it. Otherwise, we have a UDP packet. If the port matches the port we're trying to receive on, we will invoke the function, we'll pass you the packet, as well as the parsed UDP, and return sum. Otherwise, it was a UDP packet, but it wasn't destined for us, in which case, see if the destination port does have a destination that's currently bound. If it does, then push that packet directly onto that queue, and then return out. And that's it. So now if I reset, we should be able to see every packet. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. Yeah, even though it's getting picked up in 51, and we can verify that, we can say uh, print uh, push to this queue, uh, EDP desk port. And this is gonna say, like clearly this code is correct. Um, Move out a packet. Um, well, it it doesn't it doesn't fucking matter. It it just it just definitely works. Uh, if it wasn't for us, we push it into that location. So now we can have multiple binds and multiple listeners. So now, multiple things on the system. Since this is immutable, we have one on 50 and one on 51. Now if I change this to send to 50, we'll see we got one on 51. And even if the one that is at 50 is currently reading it, doesn't matter. So we'll try to read packet. We'll print it if we got it. We have two active binds. And that allows us to queue things up. And then we receive them when we go to receive them. Yeah, so this works just fine. So, wow, that's actually pretty fucking cool, to be honest. This is a pretty small networking stack. Uh, a lot of this is just parsing EDP, but like the actual, the actual code for like preserving the packets on the stack is like 20 lines of code. It's... It's basically the like receive UDP. So this one on UDP bind, which takes a self. This code, which actually like reads the packet, parses it, and then puts it up. Now the question is, is there any way that I can store that caching information? Or that when when I parse this, I have the UDP, and I don't think there's any way that I can store that parsed UDP structure. Which sucks really sucks. So I have to reparse it here. I could technically have UDP not have a reference to the actual payload, but rather it would have offsets. Async unembedded. I, I don't think I want async. Pretty sure. A async requires threads, fundamentally, doesn't it? It requires threading. And I'm not going to have threads in this kernel at all. Um, it doesn't require threads? 
You sure about that? Async. Some bare metal with no threads. So you get an A weight. That returns async. Um, you sure? So what what async are you really doing then? Like how how would async be any different than me? Like what what do you actually get with async that would do really anything for me? Because unless I can suspend a task and move on to do something else, which I can't in most of these situations. Like, I'm pretty sure I'm just fine with a non-blocking receive. I, I don't think async is any different in that case. I don't, I don't know what async changes. Um... Async is, is, it can suspend itself by yielding and hanging in the background, and I would consider that threads. <clears throat> I would consider that threading. Even if it's a task, right, or tasking, whatever you want to call it, it requires the concept of that you can switch to doing something else. Yeah, cooperative multitasking, yeah. Um... It's just not, it's not something I think I'll have, really, at all. I don't think. I mean, I'll have to read more into async. But there's really nothing that I'm going to be doing that's async. I'm going to get a DHCP lease, and I'm going to spin in a loop waiting for a packet. And then when I get your packet, I know you have a lease, and I'll move on. You can do it without implementing threads in your OS, but I consider tasks to be equivalent to threads. <clears throat> like, it's still, to me, kind of the same concept of the system is doing different things depending on kind of the state of who can do what. And you basically throw all determinism out the window the second you add it. Um, like every, every transaction that I need to do is blocking. There's really nothing I'm doing that's non-blocking. Um, the only reason I want non-blocking is that I can have a timeout. <laughs> like, that's it. But like, I, I... I seriously can't think of a single thing in my kernel that needs to be, that isn't blocking. You can fully control who executes when you're, when you implement the executor. Yeah, but at that point you're writing a scheduler, right? Like, if you have an async where it's pulling through these things, and you have four different async tasks waiting for a network packet on their explicit port, 
then you will effectively have non-determinism if one of them gets their packet prior to another. Whereas if you're writing a fully synchronous uh, blocking-based kernel design, uh, you would never have a situation where two things are waiting for a result from a packet at the same time, and thus you'll only process one of the packets at a time. I don't know. I've I've never really seen the biggest drive to async except for really like network server server development. I guess this is kind of using it to make tasks in their kernel where you basically have these like move const, uh, constructs. Which To, to me, it's just like a, a I, don't, I don't know, the, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm missing something about async, but like, I, I, the, the thing about async that I, that I don't understand is how is this really any different than me just like moving a, I guess this is just moving a closure. Uh, async just allows you to like create a closure. Because I can just box up an FN and put it in a vector and then have a loop on that vector and I have tasks. But like I, I genuinely don't know what async actually does other than basically put a, a boxed closure into a vector that it then iterates over the vector I guess you can do a wait, and a wait is indicating that uh, you can go do something else. I see. So basically, it's it's the ability it's the ability to yield while executing. Yeah. See, and I'd consider that a thread. <laughs> I'd I'd basically consider that a thread. <laughs> Like the ability that you can do something that's blocking and have something else execute while you're blocking. It's really cool. I like it. <laughs> but yeah, I guess that's the only difference. Async and await, it just allows you to yield execution while you're doing something that's blocking. And then everything, like you'd have to implement await on timer such that timer is aware of that. And I'm guessing that it would still run through all the tasks, and then there'd be a way to quickly see when this is done. Yeah, thread is typically preemptible. Async executor could not be, yeah. There are more synchronous way of returning than promise-based functions, yeah. You have to implement future pull, right? And I'm guessing that's something that it will, if you implement future poll, I'm guessing all that does is checks whether or not you're done, right? You just have to return like a boolean of if you're complete. Uh, the type of value, oh, that's when you're actually complete, yeah. Every context, what is a context? But yeah, it's just it's basically just closures with yields, I guess. Blah blah blah. Oh, these are actual threads? I mean, I understand, like, what it does. And I understand how you'd implement it. It's really easy. 
you know. Yeah, you have to. Interesting. Making those V tables. What? Okay, that makes sense. Don't have to pull in a loop. But I'd still say this is only useful if you have something else to do. And I don't think I'll ever have a situation in my kernel where I'll have something else to do. Like, I, I would say tasks and threads are basically fundamentally attached to um, uh, providing, like, services or working with uh, multiple devices. And, like, in my case... I'm going to want to boot an operating system in a hypervisor. To do that, I'm going to want to download a file to run in a hypervisor. There's really nothing I can do while I'm waiting for the download to complete. I would say there's, you pretty much like need a user interactive system for tasks to be important. Um, but I do like that. I, I've never looked into implementing async, and I think for other designs that I do, I definitely would be interested in it. So, but my kernel is just unique in that it just does math. <laughs> it has no user input at all. So if there's no user input and no user output, there's pretty much no need to ever have tasks because you never really need to do anything in parallel. You can just do do whatever you want. The users, you yeah. I mean, the user interactivity is writing the code. Is there a case where multiple hypervisors hypervisors will run at the same time? Um, I mean, there will be multiple on multiple cores. And I'll have hypervisors that I'll swap out and switch in. But I wouldn't want to run that in async. I wouldn't want to run two different hypervisors in async. So I'm not actually, I don't actually want to run two at the same time. I want to make a decision of which one to run. Okay. All right, so we got these. We reparse those packets. <clears throat> no, it's no problem. Like, I would really, I don't know. They do look pretty neat. I never thought about using them that thinly, which is pretty neat. But... I don't know. I didn't know that 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 easy to implement. But yeah, it's effectively anywhere that I'd want to have tasks that can yield. <laughs> like, where I have concurrent things that are running where I want them to be able to, like, not waste CPU resources when something else could be running. And that's a lot of situations. I think, like, if I, if I developed a general purpose RTOS, I would absolutely use async await. Because it just seems correct. In this situation, this kernel is pretty much designed to not have anything async. Like, that's, that's one of the design goals, is to literally not have anything that would require async or tasking. But I do think for, like, an RTOS or something, that'd be pretty awesome. Or, like, a normal kernel would actually be a really cool way of doing it. Have you thought about forwarding network requests from the hypervisor? Like, have the guests be able to access the real network? Um, 
I don't really have any interest in that because it it breaks the determinism. Maybe maybe I'll have pass through during like a snapshotting mode where I want to be able to boot the guest and like cause it to be in a certain state that maybe I need to like let's say I want to fuzz RDP. I'd want to be able to run an RDP server and then connect in and get like partway through the protocol and take a snapshot. So I'd maybe do that. Um, but that's just going to be forwarding packets, which is pretty easy. Like I would give a fake, yeah, forwarding packets actually would be super easy because I just, I just drop them onto the, uh, <laughs> onto the NIC. Like I wouldn't even care if they're valid or correct or in order or spoofing anything. I don't care. Like just, I'd just drop them right on the NIC. Okay. So let's implement DHP. All right. So here we have to give it access to the device. And now we can try out our stack, see if it actually works. <laughs> um Uh oh yeah, missing DHCP. And we'll go into DHCP, 3D4. We're gonna send a packet, okay. Uh, oh, I haven't done send yet. Yeah, we're just sending raw frames for sure. So I think we just do the same thing. This is just a wrapper that will not require mute self, and then this will send a packet self.driver.lock.send packet. Um, okay, so anywhere that I do driver, this will just do send. We gotta do all of our bind stuff set up, but the sends should be fine. Uh, device.send. And we get a reference to that device. And that's private. Make that pub. Receive UDP. Don't want that pub. But bind UDP will be pub. OK, private field, driver. That's for the receives. So, oh yeah, and then we'll implement on this impl drop for UDP bind implay drop fn drop mute self and here we'll do a self dot device dot unbind UDP and we'll give it self dot ports this will uh, unbind from the UDP port. Okay, and then we'll implement here fn unbind edp self port u16 uh, unbind from a edp port. Oops, from a edp port. And then we'll just, I think we'll just drop all those packets. Uh, we'll give them back to the network. So we'll do get access to UDP binds. Then we're going to get access to these specific binds. So we'll do uh, let mute packets is equal to um. I think we'll do four packet in, I do want to give it back to the driver. So we'll grab the driver lock and then we'll dump all these packets. So we have a bunch of packets that we queued up and four packet in UDP binds, get the port. That's fine if it panics because you should never have a port that you haven't registered because it's not a public function. And then we'll drain this. 
Um, honestly, we can just... Is there a way to move out? There definitely has to be. Um, there's probably a way on B tree map where I can just get an entry, where I can take an entry out. Remove. Yeah, remove key. Okay, that makes sense. Um, get access. DDP binds. And then we'll remove the port. And this is... Uh, queued packets so that will be a vec dq because that's the that's the value which is this vec dq so extract that vec dq out and then uh we don't have to drain it well we can go through packet in queued packets driver dot release packet packet so this will uh give the packet back to the driver and then that's it. I think we just go out of scope and we're fine. Remove. Unwrap. Okay. Go through each of the packets in the queued packets and then release the packet back to the driver. Nice. And then unbind UDP will automatically, automatically get called. So basically when we're in DHCP, what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna get access to um, previously I think we had some mute in here that we can probably get rid of now. Honestly, this device Mac is probably fine, but we'll save it off. Get a unique transaction ID, save off our device's Mac address, and then uh, bind to UDP port uh, what is it? Um, and there I reparse UDP. So source port, desk port, desk port should be 68. So we're gonna bind on 68. Uh, let bind is equal to device dot bind UDP 68. Okay, then we can make this, we can send a packet. And then wait for a DHP offer. So here we're going to do um, while, oh, this is so weird, but I can do this. I can do while bind.receive. And this takes a closure of the packet and the UDP the parse DDP, while this is none, um, yeah, we send that packet and then we'll clean up all this stuff. And then this will return none and we'll just start moving things up. So wait for the DTP offer. That's going to, oh, we're gonna bind, uh, expect could not bind to port 68 for DHCP. Okay, so we attempt to bind to the device, and then, yeah, we don't have types on these, but that's fine. Okay, now we can say if UDP.IP.ETH.DESMAC is not equal to MAC. Oh, that'll stop when we get a packet. I might have that return while not receive, and then this fn once will actually return a bool that I'll return out. But we're learning, we're learning what we actually want to do for this API. Uh, this will just return a bool. So track whether or not we, and then this will return a bool. All right. So in this case, we will return, that will be the ret, return ret. Otherwise, we'll return this.
This is a weird design. What do you mean? It definitely is. Turn false. Oh, this is false. This is false. This is funk. And I'm going to receive EDP on a port, invoke a closure, return option T where it's a T. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, might as well. I agree with that. It just it just makes it more extensible. Um Turn on option T. I do like that. Thank you for that. CVDP. This takes a T. This returns an option T. Oh, this just returns the T directly. And this returns an option T. Uh, actually, I want that to be an option T. Um, well, yeah, I don't, yeah, because I can just return none if I want to. Um, actually, I can do, do I want that? I kind of want to flat map that option. So, because that would allow me to... I would like to be able to do this while this is none and then just have this return none. I kind of like that. And then that would get flat mapped. Otherwise I would have to say like while this, yeah, while it's equal to some true or yeah, while it's not equal to some true. Um, I think I'm going to do option T because that allows me to use a uh, uh, question mark syntax and then I'll just flat map it because then inside of here I can do question marks and that will make a much more linear uh, code flow instead of making like nested like I had here, right? Nest, 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 nest. Here I'll just have question, 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 question and go down. Um, can you... I mean, I guess you can use question mark in there, but then it would be like a, a sum, sum, empty. So I think I'm going to do this. Uh, how the fuck do I want to format this, though? I think it is time to move this into a where clause. Much better. Where... F is a FN once that returns an option T. Okay. So this will return a... Yeah, that'll just be directly from there. Same with these, and then this will just be none. So I technically don't have to flat it, or flatten it. Sorry, not flat map. In this case, that'll loop forever. Um, we're gonna do receive. Receive EDP. It's the same thing, except we fill in the port for you. 
that returns a T, and then we return out that T. It's an FN once, which is nice. And this is receive a UDP packet on the bound port. Attempt. And then here, this is just self.port. Oh, and that's just receive. And pub FN that. Okay. So now I can say, um, Uh, UDP dot IP dot ETH dot dest Mac is equal to Mac and can you hmm If this if it's not equal to this return none I Don't think there's a way to simplify that. I don't think there's a way to question mark a normal if statement It'd be kind of cool if you could question mark a bool And I don't think you can that's going to be some. Nice. So then we'll parse DHP packet. Zid packet. It's already a reference. And then the UDP. So this will be let header options is equal to this. And this will take a UDP directly. Uh, UDP, UDP. Uh, create net UDP. That needs a lifetime. Okay. Associate these two. Then we don't need to parse the UDP message anymore. This is uh, get the UDP message. So that's the payload. If the source port's not equal to that, or the desk port's not equal to that, we don't care. We filter on that already. So we just cast it over. That needs an A as well. Do I actually need all those? Yeah, I think so in this case. Yeah. Oops, and then one more. There we go. So at least this builds and then 329. Okay, so parse the DHP packet. Then we'll say Why does DSP option require a lifetime? Because it returns a reference to the packet. There are no copies in this networking stack. We're like, when we're talking about UDP here, these references are literally to the DMA buffer. <clears throat> we haven't copied a single byte from the packet. Well, technically we've, we've format, we've like pulled some of the header information out, like the IP and stuff. But yeah, there are no copies in this. <laughs> yup. That's why things are a little bit weird in this environment. And I guess that's why we're using these closures here. But this needs to be able to drive 10 gigabit, in my opinion. So we'll be pushing like millions of packets per second through this pretty easily. Um, okay. So you parse the DHP packet. Obviously, the DHP stuff doesn't matter as much. But yeah, the DHP options are... I will parse a DHCP option, and then that'll be a reference. Uh, some of these will contain references to the actual uh, packet itself. Um, is it possible that Ethernet card would rewrite the buffer when we're reading it? No. So that's something we implemented earlier today, which I actually really fucking like. So basically, we have... I'll talk you through this. There's a bunch of people here who probably haven't seen this as well. Um, so we have a, we have a packet, 
So earlier today, we implemented this physcontig, and this is just physically contiguous memory that's always 4K aligned. So we basically allocate a 4K buffer that's large enough to hold any packet that we need. It's rounded up to 4K anyways, so we say 4K, even though 1518 is plenty. Uh, we just round it up to 4K. And then we have the length of this that have been filled in, but technically everything here is initialized, so like it doesn't matter if you access out of bounds. So we have a way of creating a packet. This will create a new physically contiguous packet. We have a way of checksumming, and this is parsing the IP and TCP and creating UDP packets and shit. This gives us access to the raw contents based on that length. Once again, everything's still initialized in there, here, so even if we fucked up these lengths, we would just be returning old packet data, but that doesn't, it's not a, a safety concern. At least in a kernel context where you can read the raw packets, obviously in user land, that is a safety concern. Um, so we have this concept of a packet lease, and this is where we have lifetimes kind of all over the place, but when you send a packet, you give ownership of the packet to the network card, and when you receive a packet, the network card gives you ownership of that packet. So if we look at our send and receive implementations for the net driver trait, this is what you are required, this net driver, this is what you're required to implement as a driver on the system. You have to have a way of getting a MAC address. You have to have a way of receiving. And in this case, we have a B, which, uh, which outlives A, and thus we have the self, which is the net driver itself, outlives this lease of a packet, right? Because the packet lease can be shorter lived than the entire thing. So A is a sublease from self. And then we have send where you give ownership of a packet to the network. Um, and then we have these allocate packet and release packets. By default, it'll make a new packet and then release packet that will just cause it to get dropped. So that goes to the global allocator. But this allows you to implement a free list in your driver, and that's what we do. So we have free packets, and it's really not that complex. So we impl net driver right here. So here we get the MAC address. Here we do receive. And what we do for a receive is if the descriptor is present, meaning it has been like something has been read from the network and placed into that descriptor, um, it cannot be reused until we tell it, until we tell the NIC it can reuse it. So then we get the number of bytes that were received by reading the descriptor. Then we allocate a new packet using the allocator. We get the physical address in the new packet, and then we swap this newly allocated packet with the one that we just um, with the one that was read into. And then at this point, we actually write in the new descriptor, marking the um, descriptor back up for use, and then we tell the network card about this by writing to the head. So we update the head, and at this point, this descriptor is now active again, but we've replaced it. And that allows us to return out a packet lease of this packet. And the way that that packet lease works is we return a packet lease and then when that packet lease goes out of scope, uh, which is implemented down here, when the packet lease goes out of scope, uh, it will get released back to the network's free list. So this basically means the, if you don't implement a free list, right, all these packet like Alex and freeze, ultimately we have a default implementation that will just allocate them out of the global heap and then free them back to the global heap, but it's, it's a pretty prioritized pool, so it allows you to pool them yourself. Uh, and the implementation of that is really s simple. So in the case of a alloc packet, we pop unwrap or packet new. So we either create a new packet <laughs> if there isn't one in the list, or we just pop the most recent one. And then release packet is really easy. So we, um, we allocate with a specific capacity when we create the packet buffer, this like free list of packets. And then down here, I just say, if the length is less than the capacity of that buffer, push it to the free list. In all other cases, we don't move ownership of packet into anywhere, thus packet will get dropped to the global allocator. So basically, this will pop things out of the free list, and it will push them into the free list up to a capacity, at which point it'll start putting them back to the global list to prevent this from having 10 gigs of memory allocated in some free list on some random driver. So, and I would say this is, <laughs> these uh, 
this is literally three lines of code to implement this and one line of code for this. So I don't think the burden's too high on that. But yeah, that packet lease gets that ref to the network card, which is here. <clears throat> and at which point we, the packet lease knows the owner. It has a mutable reference to the network driver that owns that packet. And then we have the packet that's leased out and we wrap that in an option sub such that we can move that packet back to the network driver by taking it out. So we take that packet out and then we give that to the uh, network driver. And then we also have a way of taking out the packet if we just want to get the packet ourselves and take ownership of it. It's not required we give it back to the NIC because we can always take it out ourselves and it'll just get free to the global allocator. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but then we honor those free lists in here because, hey, it's, it's better for performance. It's better for not thrashing virtual and physical allocations all the time. So yeah, that's basically the design of that. Uh, and that's how you can't receive into a packet because you actually get true ownership and it gets fully removed from the network list and gets replaced with a new packet. So the network card will always maintain a list of a certain amount of packets. If we keep pulling things out and we don't give them back, well, by default, it'll give them back. So we would have to take them out pretty explicitly. But yeah, I actually really like this model. Um, but yeah, that's how, that's how we're able to give that packet all the way up. And then if we look at the receive side of things, receive UDP, which is kind of the internal part, this will get a packet from the, um, the queue for that specific port. And if there's not that, we will go directly to the driver. So this moves it out of the driver. We then parse that, and the parsing does everything by references. So it moves a couple things out because it's, it's literally cheaper to copy a, an IP field out than to leave a pointer to the IP field. Like there's, just, there's no point in not just copying it out because the pointer is larger. Same for the MAC address. Like any field under eight bytes, it's more expensive to store a pointer to it. So packet UDP will parse out these structures. So we have an I, uh, ethernet, which has the desk MAC, source MAC type, and then the payload. And then the IP, this doesn't have every field. It only has the fields we really care about. Uh, the source IP, desk IP, the protocol, and then the payload. And then IP, desk port, source port, payload. And at this point, this is the actual UDP packet contents. And all these payloads get trimmed down based on their, uh, by the protocol length. So that's why we have no lengths in here, because the payload implies that. Um, and then these are all refs to the actual packet. So we still haven't moved anything out. The only things we've actually copied out are these fields that we're going to need to access to process this packet further anyways. So yeah, that's basically the design we have so far. And I really like it. Um, <laughs> I think it's really fucking cool. And then we give ownership of the send packets. So for send, send we literally give the packet by ownership to the network card. Uh, now I understand why everything's covered in lifetimes. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise I'd just like start RCing some shit. <laughs> but, and then for send, currently our send is blocking. It only allows us to send one packet at a time because we block until it transmits. Um, but we can make it, uh, we can make this non-blocking by queuing up enough to fill up the ring buffer and then storing the packets as metadata as like these are currently pending. And then once we observe that those packets have sent, we can then release those packets back in. But right now we wait for it to actually transmit um, just cause I haven't thought through all the logic yet, but this is totally doable. We can just, instead of releasing it, we can put it in a like pending. And then when the tail updates to a certain amount, we'll release it from pending back into this list. Um, so that logic will work. We just have to implement that. But yeah, that's, uh, that's a no copy networking stack, a no copy non-blocking networking stack. Um, and I think the only problem that I'm seeing now that I really don't like is having to get these locks on everything. So at this point, sending, we have to get a lock of the driver, which makes sense, potentially. I think I might make it possible. If I, if I have the RX heads, or if I have the TX heads and tails uh, as atomics, I could actually not have, 
I could actually make this not require a lock, because we can just bump the tail in an atomic and then find the descriptor and fill it in. At that point, we know we have exclusive access to that descriptor. Um, and then receives are kind of similar, to be honest. So I'm pretty sure, while I have this stuff covered in pretty heavy locks right now, uh, we only need those locks to send in receive, and I'm pretty sure that by using atomic U sizes for the heads and tails of these lists, I can actually make these um, thread safe. So, yeah, because at that point they would have exclusive access to a specific location in the buffer. Um, so that's probably what we'll eventually do, and then we won't need locks. Well, obviously we might still have to spin while the driver hasn't sent things, because the send is blocking. The send won't return until a packet sends on the NIC, but we only have a certain amount of packets in the buffer on the network card. So, yeah. Anyways, that's the design for this whole thing. Um, and let's go into DHCP and see how this pans out. And I think this is actually gonna get really clean. What Vim plugin do you use? Yeah, it's just uh, it's just a horizontal split. You can do horizontal and vertical splits. And then resizing with a mouse is just uh, you enable the mouse mode, which is enabled by default in Vim. Everything that I'm doing here is default Vim, except for like some things you don't see where I disable like undo files and stuff. But yeah. Okay. So this is parse a DHCP packet. That'll make sure that it is routed to where we expect, I think. Well, we check the Mac. We then parse the DHCP packet. And then here we do any. I feel like there's something different than any. There's like an any equivalent on, yeah, VS and, you can do, you can do VS or VSP to vertical split and then SP to split. That's what I use. I use the shortcuts. I mean, I use them all the fucking time. So any, test if any of them match a predicate. Um, all. Filter. Find. Hey, I can do find. Is there a find where it doesn't give you the item out? But I'm gonna search for, um, we're gonna do options dot find something that matches a predicate, which returns a bool, which is if X is equal to an offer. And if we find something that'll return out the first one, I'm guessing, it'll stop as soon as it returns true. Okay, so this will see if it's a offer. If we can't find an offer, then it wasn't an offer packet. Dude, this is f fucking sweet. And we got an iter.find. But nevertheless. And that takes ref self item. What? Oh, cause that, mm. well, we'll, we'll do this ref ref <laughs> kind of fucking gross, but yeah, technically this iterator is a reference to the things and then those themselves and the find is a reference. So it's a reference to a reference kind of fucking weird. So this is uh, parse the DHP packet. Uh, check if this is an offer, if it's not an offer turn out. Dude, I love this. Offer IP is equal to sum U32 from big Indian header YI adder. Save the offer IP. And then we'll grab the server IP. And this will be equal to, oh, fuck yeah. Options.iter.find x where You can see this effect in below. Yeah, the double ref. Yeah. Um, Iter.find. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. Uh, is it matches? Oh, fuck yeah. I forgot about matches, man. Um. Rust, rust matches. I forget, you do like X comma, maybe? No, it's, uh, is it matches? What's the new macro they added? Core matches. Okay, so it is matches. And that's a macro, right? Yeah. So it's globally exported. Okay, expression and then the pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it does take an X. So we'll say if X, because we don't care about the contents in this case. Uh, oh. Find map. That's what we want. We want find map. And that'll return a sum and a B. Fuck yeah. If. So then I can do a. It'd actually be really cool if there was a shortcut. Is there a shortcut for. Um... I want like. A... I want something where I do. So this is effectively what I'm going to do is if. Let DHP option uh, server IP IP is equal to X, then X else none, right? And this is sum. But I kind of want a shortcut for that. I, I really want like a, I want like a matches, but matches returns a bool, right? Yeah, it's purely a bool, isn't it? But I, I want like a matches X and then I can like extract a specific field, but I guess there'd be no way to really do that. Cannot be stored outside of a closure. Yeah, the if let is the shortcut. Yeah, and then we just gotta clone that. Um. I'm gonna just ref ref that. Actually, dot, oh, IP, sorry. And that's gonna be a reference to the IP. I don't know how many DREFs this is. I'm guessing it's two. Allocate packet, net device. Oh. I can relax that, I think, on network. Yeah, we're locking it anyways. That was just uh, old. OK. Yeah, let's see if that fits one line. Ooh, I think it might. Okay, save the server IP if it was present. I think I actually want to unwrap both of those. Oh, is Russ gonna be smart enough for this? Can I do these? I think I need to make these mutable. I don't know if Rust is smart enough for this. Yeah, Rust isn't going to be smart enough to know that those are initialized only once. So we will have to put this in a sum. And then that will get, that'll assign that. Okay. Anyways, honestly, I think this API is pretty good. <laughs> you get a net device. In this case, it was passed to us, but we'll have like a get net device. You bind a UDP port 68. This is constructing a DHCP packet, so it's relatively complex. But here we create the DHCP packet, and then we send it. And we allocate a packet such that we fill it in in place, and then we move ownership of that. 
And then here we receive, and this is basically like a filter <clears throat> on what we're doing. So we can say, if the desmac doesn't mac our, our match, so like, or doesn't match our mac, check that the destination is us. If the destination is not us, return none, parse the options, check if, check if this is an offer. So if any of the fields are an offer, save the offer IP. Technically, this will stop on the first one. That is an offer, so you could have a message type. You could have like duplicates, it's technically not allowed in DHCP, where it would behave erroneously. But if you're if you're getting leases like that, yeah, it doesn't fucking matter. Like this won't crash. It might do the wrong thing, but what am I gonna do? Ask for a lease from a different server when that server is the one responding? Save the IP. Okay. Now, we get to this stage. Now here we get the offer IP and the server IP. If neither of them were present, then we have an issue. Here we create options for the request. We clear, clear the options. We mark that we have a request, requested IP, server IP. Technically, I could put these in a list and serialize them all in like some loop. We set the parameter list that we want a message type, a broadcast IP, and a subnet mask, and then we serialize the end. We then create this DHCP packet. Now we're doing the same logic as up here. Here. And this is wait for DHCP ACK. Check the destination is us. Make sure we can parse it. Make sure this is an ACK. Here we're gonna check for an ACK. And then at this stage, we save a couple more options we save the broadcast IP and the subnet mask. Um, so this will be the offer IP we don't save. This is the broadcast IP. And this will be broadcast IP. Okay, and then this is save the a uh, subnet mask if it was present. Subnet mask. Turn sum. That pursed everything out. I think that's it. I think that is DHCP now with our new driver, which is a little bit cleaner. And then, oh, those don't need to be mutable. Wait, what? 270, DHCP header. Yeah, that doesn't need to be. 378, subnet mask, that's why. About to say, Rust is not smart enough to figure that one out. Uh, 115 on net. Queued packets. Yeah, because that's, yep. 62, device. All right, and then we have a lease and we're just gonna print that lease here. And then parse DHCP packets. That doesn't use the packet at all anymore. Okay, 221. So we can, we can actually just give this this. Or just takes the UDP, which makes sense. Three D six. Don't have to give it the packet, which means we don't use the packet here, which is good. That's what we want to actually see. So typically, these things will just use the pre-parsed and not have to do any parsing themselves. And then three D six. For this second one, we ignore the header. We only care about the options. Okay, so this should get a lease. And let's see what we get. Reset. Send to discover, and there's our lease. And let's uh, hex print that. Actually, let's, let's implement an IP address. Let's implement a fucking IP address structure so we can pretty print IPs and parse them from strings. Um... 
pubstruct IP. And I think I already call this IP. Yeah, we'll call this IP adder. And we'll say an IPv4 adder. How does Rust stylize theirs? Might as well just make it identical. This is a uh, IPv4 address. And then this will implement drive clone copy partial EQ EQ or doesn't really make sense, but technically we could implement it. What do they all add? They add ORD as well, and hash. We don't have hash, actually. Yeah, I guess we'll add partial ORD and ORD. Okay. And then this will just contain a U32, just to make it easier on copies. And now I can impl uh, debug for IPv4 adder, fn self uh, debug, and this takes a formatter, I think. I always forget what this takes, and it returns a, a format result, I think. So we'll pull in use core format debug. And I'm pretty sure it takes a format arguments, a mute format arguments. Ah, core format debug, okay. Yup, and yeah, it takes a formatter. Uh, format, mute, format, formatter, returns a format result. Okay. And we'll pull in self. And we can pull in formatter too. That's fine. That's not going to be a. I don't like overriding the result type, the default result type. And then this is not debug. This is, I think, format. FMT. Oh, that doesn't take a type. <laughs> All right, we got there. We got there. Now we can do a write to format of this dot this dot this dot this. And that will take self. Maybe I do want those to be bytes. Mm. Let's do self shift. Um, eh. IP is equal to self dot zero dot two begin in bytes IP zero IP one IP two IP three and then I guess we just return the result to that right okay so now anywhere that we do u thirty twos likely need to be an IPv4 address Okay, and then we'll impl from u32 for IPv4 adder, fn from val u32 self, this is a IPv4 adder of the value, okay, uh, 445. Um, and we can do the other way from IPv4 adder. I think we might have to do into on this one. Can we implement on U32 here? Val.0. I think we have to do... Oh, we can. 419. Dest IP into, into, ah, oh, fuck, we just passed that line. Okay, 451, source IP, into, uh, 
Um. Okay. Wait, what? What is source IP in this case? This is the source IP into. How do you do into with a. And yeah, we'll implement into for that. Into colon colon. Ah. Kind of gross. Dest IP, dest IP. Oh, got to get rid of these. Whoops. Could easily type dot zero. Yeah. And look at that. We implemented for U32. I don't know. I <laughs> Could easily, yeah. I don't know. I just like to stick to the constructs that I'm forcing my user to users to use. For a consistency, but yeah, we can apparently impl on uh, U32. I think for integers you can do it, or for some like primitive types you can do it, but not for structs or something. If I'm not mistaken, two big onion bytes, zero, one, two, three, and now. Source IP, dust IP. I think it's because he implemented from your type. Ah. IPv4 adder. IPv4 adder. Hmm. Nice. Okay, so that starts breaking stuff. 537. Yep. Yep. Okay, U32s here, here. Let's check some IPs that's converting them. Yeah, we're just gonna dot zero those. It is cleaner in this in this case. Uh U thirty twos. Okay, so now DHCP Um two sixty five. Uh, so these, I can do a dot into on this. Do I need to, now I need the U32 it? Or is Rust smart enough in this case? All right. So now we should be able to debug print that lease Oh, these are U32s right now. IP adder, IPv4 adder. And we'll leave these as U32s in the raw packet. We could rep or C. Yeah, we'll do that before we screw something up. We'll rep or see this just for safety, but I don't think I'm actually gonna use it in these cases. And then these we just have to pull in from IPv4 adder. Accurate, 406 into.
Um, actually, do I want to do those at the site? I think I will. And Rust, I think, can figure that, figure out that into. No, it cannot. Huh. Oh, because we also use it here. Ah, it doesn't know the fucking type. Yeah, it's due to the... I use it in a place that takes a U32, and then Rust gets really confused. But at this point, I convert it into something. It's unwrapped. Here it's used in a U32 spot with an into, and here it's used as a IPv4 adder, which should be the concrete type, in my opinion. Um, but it looks like it can't figure that out. Silly Rust. Not a big deal. 348. That I think I'll just get for free. Yikes. I'm okay with that. Uh, 365 into 350. Yeah, we do have to deref it. 410 broadcast IP. In these cases, this will be a option IPv4 adder. This will be an option IPv4 adder. Wow, we did all the UDP stuff. I actually didn't think I was going to get to that today. The like whole queuing, like multiple uh, immutable binds. Pretty fucking cool. If I do say so myself. I think this is my the syntax that I think is acceptable. These are kind of the only ways that I do ifs. I do one lines, three lines, or the the five lines. I don't really like anything in between. When we fix all the U32s. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, let's try it. Let's try and nuke this one. I think you're right. Well, those ones are only used for returns. I think these ones might not be happy. Yeah, it doesn't like that one. And it probably won't like this one because it's used in a similar way. Yeah. So those ones we have to type. It just can't figure that out. Okay, so let's try this out. Hey, we got a lease. That's our IP. That's the server's IP. There's the broadcast address, and that's the subnet mask. Pretty fucking good. What education? Yeah, I just have a high school. High school education. We real educated here. Is this a kernel for personal use? Yes. All right, let's... DHP... I'm gonna super pretty print that. <laughs> All right. There we go. Client IP, serve IP, the broadcast IP, subnet mask. Fuck yeah. Technically, we will need those to be renewed every renewal time. We do get that information out, but. Uh, We'll have to figure out a time to... I think that'll just be on, like, receives or something. Because everything's blocking. Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to pick when I renew that lease. I think I'm going to save my timestamp counter. Let's, let's calibrate our TSC quick. I might just steal some code for this, because the code that I wrote is already perfect. Uh, but we're going to have time.rs, and I'll open up uh, sushi roll... 
kernel source time. So these are the functions that I always implement in my kernels. So future, this returns returns the uh, TSC value upon a future uh, future um, time in microseconds. And this way, we can use a multiply instead of a divide. It's Basically, we can compute out a time to give up on something. Let's try this here. We'll do um, uh, routines to get access to wall clock time. Uh, well, <laughs> time to get access. Uh, routines to convert from microseconds to timestamp counters. <laughs> it's more, more specific. So we get the TSC, we multiply it by the uh, CPU frequency, and we'll put that on core structure. Returns the system uptimes in, second as f ugh, in seconds as a float, which is already TSC elapsed. Is it hard to get the actual time? Like the actual time, like, like Unix time, pretty much impossible, because um, it's, it's relative to system boot. It just counts cycle since boot. And then it's really, and if you mean actual time in terms of seconds, it's actually really difficult. We have to calibrate uh, very, very, very recently, like in the past two years, Intel gave access to that. Yeah, BIOS keeps time. That's through the RTC, the real-time clock. Um, but that only has second-level precision. But we can actually use the real-time clock value and then add these values on top to get a more granular value. That's what pretty much all operating systems do. So this is going to uh, return number of seconds elapsed since a prior TSC value. So in this case, we subtract off the current time minus the start time as an F64 divided by the frequency divided by a million. So this is, uh, yeah, I guess I store CPU frequency in... Yeah, I, I gotta figure out what format I store that as. This is a busy sleep for a given number of number of microseconds. Now, unfortunately, this is gonna add a lot to our boot time. RDTSC, I don't want this in time. So this will compute a future time, and then while the RDTSC is less than this, we'll pause. We can actually do uh, unsafe, actually, Core sync atomic uh, weights or something. Spin loop pin. Okay, so while, and this has no unsafe anymore. Well, it will for calibrate. So we've got microseconds times the CPU frequency. So I guess I store, well, we'll figure out what, would I, what I actually store. So this is using the pit, determine the frequency of the timestamp counter, round this to the nearest 100 megahertz and return it. <laughs> what do I use to debug my code? Yeah, prints. I typically don't use debuggers for my own code. I only really use debuggers for other people's code. I don't know. I, I've kind of always been like that. The rule of C comments in Rust for me is that you know that this cold, this code was written in the first like two months of me learning Rust, because that was the format that I used back then. Codes updated. Turn out the rounded rate. Okay. So in this case, using the program, programmable interval timer, return the frequency of RDTSC. Run this frequency to the nearest 100 megahertz and return it. So we save off the TSC value. We then program the pit to count down. Uh, we mask interrupts from the pit, and thus we pull by sending the readback command to check blah, blah, blah. Then we send the readback command to latch the status on channel zero. 
And yeah, here we're basically spinning until the count... Uh, if the output pin is high, we know the countdown is done. Break from the loop. I might need to consume that interrupt. Compute the time in seconds that the countdown was supposed to take. Compute the megahertz. So... Compute the megahertz per second. <laughs> the, the the megahertz per second. That's a that's a new one for me. That's a, <laughs> megahertz per second squared, or <laughs> cycles per second squared. <laughs> so this is going to get microseconds times. I yeah. I guess we store the frequency in megahertz. That makes sense. So this will get the compute the megahertz for the RDTSC. And we will do RDTSC as a float divided by elapsed, which is the cycles per second, and then divide that by a million megahertz per second squared. <laughs> Runs in the nearest 100 megahertz value. And then we have an RDTSC rate. We can actually put that in a, in a globe, globule. Um, I think that's what we're going to do. Instead of this thread, uh, self dot. Uh, yeah, we'll do uh, static. Oh, I had to put it in the thread because in Sushi Roll, I don't have shared memory. <laughs> uh, RDTSC megahertz. This is an atomic U size. U64. 64 new. Oh, and this is in megahertz. Uh, the TSC tick rate in megahertz. Uh, we default to a 3 gigahertz tick rate, which is likely within a ballpark of actual uh, tick rates if you happen to use the time routines prior to routines prior to calibrating the TSC, right? So basically it's got like a sane-ish value to start off. Load ordering relaxed. Uh, use CPU is a crate, so we'll use core sync atomic atomic U64 and ordering, and we'll do relax because we want the perf of these to be as cheap as possible. Thread CPU freak. RDTSC megahertz load ordering relaxed. Do you like Rust syntax? I love it. It's fantastic. Okay, and then I'll do RDTSC megahertz store rounded rate um, ordering relaxed. More than C, absolutely. So much better than C. Just having like matches and if lets, having iterators, oh, so nice. Having traits. Okay, and then this is uh, store the TSC rate. And here we'll say uh, print calibrated the TSC to. Calibrated the TSC to this dot four megahertz. And we'll pull in time. Mod time. And then we'll calibrate the TSC very early on. Um Calibrate the TSC so we can use time routines. 
if core ID is zero, we can do this like right fucking away. Self uh, time calibrate. That's unsafe. So we'll do that right away because this doesn't require anything on the system. And we'll make sure we just get that out of the way so that we can we can time things even in very, very early stages. Thread 18. Uptime. Oh, I don't I don't store the boot time. We could. We could store the boot time. Actually, let's do that. This will be the start time. Um, RDTSC start. Load, ordering, relaxed. And this is the RDTSE start. This is the uh, timestamp counter at the time of boot of the system. Starts at zero. Then calibrate, we'll set this. Dot store, start, ordering, relaxed. I think all these are relaxed, good. We just want max perf on those. Uh, and then this doesn't return a U64, calibrate. Okay. So what I should be able to do now is we'll see a calibrated Hmm. I don't think it likes that interrupt firing. We have interrupts disabled. I think it's getting smoked by that interrupt. I want to use a different pit mode. I'm pretty sure I can use uh, timer number two instead. Channel zero is directly connected to IRQ zero. This was once used for DMA for refreshing RAM. Later machines, it was done in hardware and the pit is no longer used. Ooh, on modern computers where it's implemented a large scale integrated circuit, it's no longer usable in a lot of situations. Shit. And I don't have a way of suppressing that interrupt. Interrupt on terminal to count. So it generates RQ zero. No. Oh no, I ran out of disk space. <laughs> Rip. The VOD stopped recording. Let me let me free some space quick. Um, um uh, FH All right, now I got 350 gigs left. I some I can't close the prompt from OBS. It's kind of weird. Well, whatever. I'll just re-download the VOD from Twitch. I've done it a couple times before. All right. To use mode zero, interrupt after countdown. This causes an interrupt to occur after about this. We mask interrupts from the pit. Uh, so yeah, we don't want to do that. I think, yeah, we'll change this. Interrupt on terminal count.
Um, harder retriggable one shot. Similar to mode zero. Doesn't start. Until a rising edge of the gate input is detected. It's not usable on pit for. Okay, makes sense. Um, output signal goes high, and the pit waits for the reload register after it's been set. Decrement the current counts. When it decrements from two to one, output goes low, go high again. Uh, generates a pulse when the counts generate hit zero. Um, we'll wrap around and continue to decrement. Shit. Hmm. What mode can I use here? I think I can write the... Rate generator? It's a frequency divider. Current count will be set in the reload value on the... After it's been set, the current counter will be set to the reload value on the next falling edge. Subsequent falling edges of the input signal will decrement the current count. When it decrements from two to one, the output goes low. And on the falling edge of the, it'll go high again. The current count will be set to the reload value and continue. If the input goes low, counting stops and the output goes high immediately. Um, I'm pretty sure I can use a different mode here. I'm going to do or we're going to try mode one and let's see if this gives us the interrupts. Okay. Is there another issue then? Let's see if we're... Oh, it's because we don't have print set up. Yeah, we can't print there. Okay, then this interrupt one was probably fine then. Yeah, we have all the interrupts masked on the pick. Okay, yeah, so that literally will not happen. All right, so that'll calibrate the TSC. And let's see what it picked for the system. Um, here we'll have a, we'll implement a pub fn uh, TSC megahertz. This will return uh, u64, which is, just load that. Get the uh, TSC rate in megahertz. So now I can print that at the end. We'll print that like here. CP, uh, TSC megahertz is this time TSC megahertz. And then we'll see if that's in the ballpark. 3200 cat proc. CPU info, 3,200, ho, 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 wee, wee. All right, so that means we can use uh, time. Also means we can see this, all course online. We can print a Linux D-message style 
uh, 16.8 and we'll do time uptime get the uptime of the system and this will basically show us the boot time 50 oh yeah 55 uh, yeah, that's about 550 millis. Oh, yeah, and we got a DTP lease in that time. Oh, that's not bad at all. We we're, were able to boot, initialize all the PCI devices, get a lease, and we booted in under under a second. <laughs> that's pretty fucking good, then. I'm happy with that. And we spent 54 millis calibrating the TSC. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, we spent 54 milliseconds calibrating the TSC. So we actually booted. We, we, we booted basically instantly. Oh, wait, I'm not storing. Oh, that's the, that's that one. Um, E1000. Yeah, I store. Can you do something else while the timer is calibrating? Not really. Because I have I have to block to see when it completes. Okay. Um. And here we'll just do allow unused. Okay. Noise. Let's get that DCP lease. Bam. And then we don't do 10 D3, so let's get this uh let's get this network driver working on that. So the other one is a uh 574. So basically we gotta make sure everything's compatible in here, but we'll probably just end up making some tables. So this will not work, right? It shouldn't, because they have different addresses. Yeah, one of them, this one's just stuck. Okay. Um. Okay. Now what we'll do is for the E1000E. I think. What's the best way for me to do this? I think we'll do a struct. And this is like, uh, this is uh, Nick registers. These are network register offsets. Uh, these may vary slightly between each Intel NIC, thus we have a different register list for each. Okay, so everything in here where we do a write, so I'm gonna close some of these things down. And then we gotta make our DHCP stuff have a timeout as well, but we'll get to that. PCI we don't care about. Just care about E1000. So at this point, any place that we do a dot write, okay. So we'll have device control register. So this is control U32 uh, device control register. Okay, where's the summary? There we go, that's what I want. So this will be, when we pass new, we'll pass the registers. Mine's sharing VimRC, it's all stock. It's the default VimRC. Regs. We'll store the registers, the NIC registers. And these are the network 
we won't use this. Not re registers are per nick registers for uh, the different registers we use. Thanks a lot. No problem. Let's go to 46. Um, and then here we'll have Nick registers. Nick registers this. We'll fill these in. Okay, network registers. Fuck yeah, and then PCI device. Bye bye. 36. Control zero. So then, any place that we use this, so dot write, basically all of these will change nick dot regs dot init. Uh, actually, control. Nick dot regs dot control. Expected use size. Oh, we can do that. <laughs> I want to say I love your streams. Well impressed by your work ethic. Thank you so much, Shaquille Oatmeal. <laughs> I randomly just popped into this stream. This uh, is this what coding is like. I'm so interested in it, but I'm uh, but I'm scared. I mean, this is relatively difficult low level development. Uh, so I wouldn't say this is really. Uh, what a lot of programming is, but and then we'll do uh, or write read. Um, so I would say that this is a little bit more difficult. How the fuck do I search for ors? God damn it! How do I do an or in Vim regex? But yeah, there's there's so many different other things you can do that are higher level and easier to work with and. And whatever, but I just love this stuff, man. Gobble this shit up all day. Oh, you gotta escape the pipe. Ah, why, thank you. Okay, nick.regs.control. This is the IMC. IMC. U size. This is the interrupt. Mask clear. Nick.regs.imc. And handle devices. Takes another arg, but I think we're fine. I'm going to make sure this is building before I screw this up. Oops. And then this we can derive clone and copy. We'll pass this. We have an IMC at OXD8. Then we pass in the regs. This takes regs. 215. Regs. Okay, sweet. Nick.regs. This is the received descriptor base. RDBAH, I think. Or RDBAL. This is the receive descriptor base low. Receive descriptor base high. RDBA. RDLEN, we'll need that. Our length, and I think we use the tail, the head and the tail. Receive descriptor base, or receive descriptor length, receive descriptor head, and receive descriptor tail. And this is RDH and RDT. These are literally just verbatim from here. So we've got 
Artie Bao at OX2800. Artie Ba, 2804. Uh, Artie Len, 2808. Oops. 2808. RDH, OX2810. RDT, OX2818. Um. Do, 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 2804, 2818. Okay. Done. Now we can do percent S. OX 2800. We'll just search for. Oops. Nick dot regs dot RD bow. Okay. Nick.regs.rdba2808. Nick.regs.rdlen. Nick.regs.rdh. Nick.regs.rdt. 2810, 2018, self.regs.2018, that's tail, even though we call it head, 28, oh, it's 28, fuck yeah. Um, how do you know that your driver support for the... Uh, for the device in question, when does that happen? So we enumerate the PCI bus. So in kernel source PCI, we enumerate the PCI bus, and that will tell us what devices are on the system. And the PCI header, so we're going through every single bus, every single device, every single function on every device, and we query them, and we ask them what they are. And they tell us their vendor ID and their device ID. And through that, we can determine whether or not it is a card that we support with our driver. <clears throat> but there's a database of that, so you can look for um, PCI ID database. And this has a list of all of the different devices. <clears throat> um, and basically, you know that if you have a device with these certain things, it's this kind of a device. And in your driver, you'll have a table that will handle certain devices, and that's what we have here. We're checking for the device ID or the vendor ID and the device ID to determine if we have a if we have support for that. So yeah, that's how we do that. Here we're gonna do write or read grouped. Per uh, paren ox zero through nine a through f. Even though it can't be a through f, but we're just doing this. So we have a I think for all of these we have the td and I think those are the names for them td bal. And I'm pretty sure I can do this. 3800, 3804, TD1, 3808, TDH, TDT, 3810, 3818. Okay. So this will be nick.regs.tdbal, nick.regs.tdbah, nick.regs.tdbah. Uh, 3808, tdlen, nick.regs.tdh, nick.regs.tdt. We got a 5400. Um, this is the RAL, OX. 5400, and this is the ra, and this is for ral, this is for the zeroth entry in there, in the receive address list, 
5400 and 5404, and we're just going to say RAL0 and uh, so nick.regs.ral0, nick.regs.ral1. Then we get the MAC address. We've got 100, which is the R control. And we have the T control, I'm guessing. T control, yep. So this is nick.regs.r control, nick.regs.t control. Okay, we got a tail pointer 3818, nick.regs.tdt. We got a 3810. This is nick.regs.tdh. Okay. Now, everything's been moved into there. And we'll just yoink. Uh, yoink, paste, T, 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 S, receive, transmit, G. That was easy. Round zero. This is the... Um, Rel, okay, receive address low. So the receive address high uh, for the zeroth entry in the table. Uh, for the zeroth entry in the table. Okay. Now what we want to do is our control receive control and T control transmit control uh, 443 this is actually on self self and we put two dots on that one too okay uh, 337, yeah, this is the raw. Okay, so this should be able to get a lease. And sweet, we did get a lease. Good sign. Now, we want to implement this table for another Nick. So we're going to grab those. Send those to one. Merge these two Firefoxes together. Okay. So now we have multiple network cards. So this is the other one we want to do. We want the PCI configuration space. No. Is it? Um, already bought. Val? Really? Configuration register space. Okay. So control is in the same spot. Then we got to make sure we have the same bits in the same spots. So anywhere that we use control. We set 126, and we wait for it to clear. So we need to make sure that 26 is the reset bit on all of them. And it is. And then on this one, we got to do the same thing. Control, 26. Reset, self-clearing. OK. So, we can safely say that all of these um, I'm just going to yoink, paste. This is a 10D3. Okay. 
So on the IMC, we want to make sure that there is a clear. Yeah, let's find register summary. OK, IMC, internet mask clear. It's at D8. And this one, the IMC. is at D8. Sweet. They're all at the same location, and we'll grab this table. Oops. Grab this table. For this, uh, 1533. All right, so the IMC is the same, and the values we write are the same. It's just the interrupt mask. Next, RDBOW. I think this is where they'll start to differ. RDBAL0. That's at 2800. Really? Alias offset? Oh, I see. So it's at 2800. 2804, 2808, 2810, 2818. And that's head, tail, RD len. Wow. Wow. Okay. It's going down the list. Transmits. V validate these ones. 3800, 3804, 3808, 3810, 3818. Okay. Rowl. Um, where are those at? There we go. We got the Rowl. 5478. Oh, Rowl 0. 5400, 5404, 5408, or 5404, and then R control, receive control, 100, and transmit control, transmit control, 400. Okay, these are identical. Um. Wow. Let E1000 regs is equal to Nick registers. I thought those differed. I guess that's only the 2810 that differs. E1000 regs. It makes sense that the E1000E and the E1000 are the same. E1000 regs. Okay. Non constant value. Oh. Const E1000 regs. Now it's constant. E1000 regs. E1000 regs. Okay. Then we have the I210. We got a D8 on that, and then the R control is at 100. RD BAL 0 is at C000, C04. C008 for RD LEN. C010. This is for head and tail. C008. Oh, there's aliases. Uh, 
There's aliases. Alias offset. 2800, 2804, 2808, 2800C. Uh, 2810, 2818. Oh, they have aliases for all these, don't they? Oh, fuck yeah. 3800, 3804, 3808, 3810, 3818. The Rowls. Uh, 2810, The Rowls are probably in this area. Yeah, here we go. Ral, alias at 40. Oh, we got a 5400 and a 5404. Okay, R control and T control. T control is at 400. R control is at 100. Shit. Shit. Surprise. Literally all the same. So. This, in theory, should then bring up two networking drivers, and I don't know why it doesn't. Let's see. Reset. Oh, it did! We got, we got two IPs! Fuck yeah! Alright, let's try it on hardware. We haven't tested any of this on hardware yet, so this is all going to be fresh. Rebooting the hardware, logging in. Remote control, reset server. Remote control, reset server. Okay, so both these servers will be rebooting. We won't have soft reboot because we'll hijack all the NICs, but we know that those have the same registers. Yeah, that shows how compatible these network cards are. I wonder if I do an Intel X540 uh, data sheet. I wonder if these have legacy support too, and I think they do. This is a 10 gig NIC. <clears throat> so we'll see if the 10 gig NIC uses the same addresses. And if it does, and these servers should be rebooting. That one's rebooting. That one's still going through the process. Nice, so they're both booting. This one will come up first. This one has two NICs, I think. Come on, man. First fucking try on hardware. Ooh. Oh. 1533. 8086, 1533. Yeah, that's that's in a loop. It's trying to get the lease. Yeah, both of these are stuck. All right. Oh, it works in the VM. <laughs> uh Okay. But yeah, we got these two two leases on both both the network implementations. I'm trying to think if there's a reason why I wouldn't be getting packets on here. Um, I'm gonna reboot both of these servers, and I'm gonna Wireshark them. So I'm gonna see. Uh, ENPS zero. All right. Oh boy. I got a filter. Capture filter. Boot P. How do I? Well, we're capturing. It's a lot of packets because I'm streaming, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to see if boot P comes up on either of these. Otherwise, I can just add some prints. We can figure out where we're getting stuck.
I do see discover request offer. Um, discover that's from Pixie. Yeah, we're not sending anything. Okay. So for some reason they're not sending anything. Um, reset. Maybe it's this. Print Nick reset. Maybe maybe some of the bits don't line up. Print programmed. Oh, we know that we're getting. Mm, well, we don't know. Nick reset programmed RX. Programmed. Programmed TX. Uh, print got Mac O2X question mark. This is a Mac address. Print enabled TX and RX. So this is how we debug here. Um, swap that shit in and we'll say, uh, print got packets. Packet.raw. It's uh, a function. Put a question mark in there. All right. Now we have some debug. So we'll reboot these machines. See what we get. Are you capturing the flyer shark? I am. Should be rebooting. Come on. That's all built. Yeah, so now we see a bunch of packets. We'll see all the packets that we receive. Okay, this is rebooting. We might have done something too strict on DHCP and we're just not getting a lease, but it is, well, it's not sending the packet. So the question is, are we even getting to the point that we're sending the packet? Uh, we did get a MAC address. Enable RX and TX. So we got a Mac, that looks real. Got a Mac over here. Okay. So we were able to get to that reset and then send. Here we'll say uh, print bumped tail with print the O2X uh, packet.raw and then print packet out. We'll see if we're trying to send and we're getting stuck here. That would indicate that maybe we have some bits we gotta change in our like send path, but that's fine. Can definitely program some of this stuff relatively easily. It shouldn't be too hard. Come on. Waiting for these reboots is going to suck. Where else could we be getting stuck? We create the we create that. Yeah, I think we're just hitting send and it's not sending. The package is not going out for some reason. So, question is why? Is it my fault? Is it something I can fix? Bump tail. Yeah, packet didn't send. Okay, sweet. 
Nice. That is... So we made a packet, we bumped tail, and the packet never went out. Alright, let's take a look. We're on an I-210. And now we want to check basically everything that we set on the NIC. Reset 126, that's fine, I think. Yeah, because that clears. And then here we write Fs to the IMC, that's fine. Arty Bal Beh. And then these descriptors set the tail as the length minus one. Pretty sure this is the same. Um, receive descriptors, R control. We set Rx enable. So our problem is on transmit. So let's ignore everything that isn't transmit right now. That's all we care about. Transmit. We set enable. Pad short packets. Padding makes the packet 64 bytes long. If padding is allowed, total length of packet, not including FCS, should not be less than 17 bytes. I don't know if I need to pad it. I don't think so. Um, maybe I need to. When set to 1B, schedules transmission. Retransmit on late collision. Okay, I don't think that's the case. Very few pa uh, switches except packets less than that. Yeah, maybe I will have to set that padding, but... Okay. So that should be valid. Um... That's receive, transmit. We write in a packet, volatile. Unless this is a caching issue. And that entry is not updated. It's not snooping. The VM might be different on the snoops. The snoop doggy dog. Hmm. I don't know. I feel like bumping that tail is still like trying to send nothing and just fail. So, yeah, we bump that tail. TDT. We write the tail, which is the tail plus one. We wait for the head to pick up to it. It's definitely not going out over the network. Um... Receive transmit functionality, packet transmission descriptors, legacy. So we write in the buffer length. And let's make sure this is good. Buffer length, we write in a command. Um, ooh. Maximum allowable packet size, blah, blah, blah. Zero length transfer no data. Must have their EOP set, PSP is set. Check some... So EOP and insert frame check. I feel like this should be the same. DD provides the transmit status when RS is set. I I'm pretty sure this should just work. I'm pretty sure this should just work. So let's go into uh, kernel source MM. Fizz contig. When we make fizz contig, we're gonna mark this uh, page. Um, uncached. Uh, page table. We're gonna mark all the memory that we put the descriptors in. It's not uncached, is it? Page table. Uh, shared page table source 
page cache disable. So we'll disable caching to those. See what we can get here. So this should still work on the VM. I'm rebooting those servers. Yeah. So this might hurt perf. Might hurt perf quite a bit. But I don't know. I When we write to this, initialize the memory, cache, disable. That's the MMIO space. And we're definitely able to read write the MMIO space. So we are finding that correctly. So I don't think that's it. So we'll see. I don't know, this is a shot in the dark. But this will make sure those descriptors are filled in. Fuck. I mean, that's good. But fuck. God damn it, what could that be? Um, blah, blah, blah. It's just, there's just a little ring boy. Oh. Little write back. All the scriptures are written back regardless of their RS. And legacy hardware transmit requests are completed by writing the DD bit to the transmit descriptor ring. Causes cache, thrash, whatever. Hardware can write the contents of the descriptor queue head to host memory. Um. All right. What other transmit shit am I not setting? Extended transmit control, retry, DMA TX. Ooh, allow, disable queue. Okay. TCP flags, total, TD bal. In order to keep compatibility with previous devices, they alias to 3800. Blah, blah, blah. Alias at 3804. Write the length. Number of eight descriptor sets, yep. Backwards compat. Um, let me find my driver for this. Uh, I can... Did I get rid of that cache disable? Pretty sure I don't need it. Yeah, there we go. Um, let's go into... Honestly, I'm going to look at my sushi roll driver. Kernel source. SP sushi, sushi roll. Kernel source net. BSP net. X540. Create the rings, read the bar, read write bar, read write volatile, same shit we're doing now. Uh, 
Header default, use legacy descriptor, drop packets when the queue is full. So let's take a look. Enable the ring and pull until it becomes enabled, okay. So this is set up the low and high parts to the physical memory. Set up the length in the TX ring descriptor. Enable the transmit queue. Set the tail pointer, and then internal tail pointers, okay? So I don't write the head pointer on mine. Well, on the old one, I don't write the head. But we set those two, we set the length. Uh, TD bow. Set the low and high. Do I have to write high then low? I'm gonna flip those just in case. Sometimes the order of things like that matter. Cause it might like latch in. I think I might have read something on that, in fact. I don't think that would be it. That would be pretty insane if that's if that does the trick, but I'm rebooting them anyways. Set up the length which we do, it's just the size of that actual structure. Enable the transmit queue. Oh, we bump the tail, or we set the tail. Why do I enable the queue? All right, so this is send. Read it. Break it a loop if DD is not set. Update the head by going through the packets pending for send and updating the... Um, maybe it is sending the packet and I'm just... I'm not supposed to check that head. I don't think so. Because I'm not seeing the packets coming through on Wireshark. Oh, what's this? Request. Yeah, we're our requests aren't going through here. Are they recent Xeons? Yeah, they're yeah, they're recent cores. And and this is cached on DMA, and I think cached on DMA always works. I need to figure this out though. Um, God damn it. All right, let's check that DD bit. So that's what we do in our X540 driver. We pull the DD bit of the status. That's on ascend. And then at this stage, wait for DD to become set. We write in one shift three or th so that's the status. So we write in what bits are we setting there? Technically, this is on the X540. So let's take a look at what we set. I think this is set status. Um. Inline functions, transmit, transmit descriptors. And here we go, we got legacy. And that's what I use, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we could just get this working on this 10 gig nick too. All right. We set EOP, insert FCS, and RS. Causes it to report the DMA completion and status indication as well as triggering ITR. Hardware indicates DMA completion by setting the DD bit of the TX descriptor when that is zero 
or by head right back if head right back is enabled. All right, let's set that bit. Let's report status. And we have that on this old one too. And we'll see if this works. So I'll bump the RX, uh, bump the TX tail. So we write the tail. Yeah, I think it might be, I mean, we are, this is where we're stuck, right? Is reading this head. Maybe we don't want to do this. So we'll set the status, one shift three. Just make sure it's the same shape. And if it is, then we should be able to, are the bits, I, RS, report status. Does this by looking at the descriptor status byte and checking the DD bit. Okay, we got a status. Status bit is, we got a DD here. And DD, where do we put status? Status. All right, let's see if that's correct. It's the bottom bit of status. And status is at 32, and then we have reserved above it. So we should be able to pull status. So while self dot, while read volatile, self.tx descriptors tx head so you don't want to bump that yet read this dot status while that and one ugh ugh while this and one is zero. So while that is one, we haven't transmit. And I'm gonna set this to a zero and I wanna see if this freezes in the VM. Reset. Okay, nice, that got stuck. And then if I set that to one shift three, reset, doesn't get stuck. Okay, let's try it on hardware. But I don't feel like that, I feel like that would only affect, I feel like I would still be able to see that packet being sent. Um, but we'll see if that makes it past it, in which case that means that it is sending it. If it doesn't make it past this, then clearly it's not sending that. But yeah, we'll read that volatile in a loop. Is right back enabled? Um... I don't have right back on that, on the MMIO space. I do have right back on this space. <clears throat> but this is DMA. The DMA stuff should be updated with uh, snooping. D made memory, I shouldn't have to read uncached. The MMIO space is marked uncached though. And I'm also not seeing the packet go out, to be, to be honest, right? I'm not seeing the packet even being transmitted. So for some reason, it does not want to send that packet. And I'm not quite sure why. We have marked that fully uncached before. Like that was our first test, is mark that fully uncached. <clears throat> and yeah, it's just, I'm not even seeing it on the network. Okay. So let me check my GitHub. I think I have a E1000E driver in this. Oh, only X540? Fuck. Enable jumbo frames, disable all interrupts. Pull until the bit's cleared. Able transmit path DMA. 
What is that? Um, that sounds very important for a 80 DMA TX control. All right. Is that a thing here? That sounds, that sounds pretty important. <laughs> if that does exist, that does sound quite important. Um, general. Transmit configuration word. Unless it's not associate, unless it's not setting up a link, but I think by default is in auto negotiate link state, but maybe it's, it's literally not even getting a link. So maybe I have to program flow controls. Read delay timer. Transmit. Oh! Applicable to that only. TX descriptor control. Disable patch packet prefetching. Okay. Controls the fetching and write back of transmit descriptors. Uh, the fetching, okay, that's important. Uh, use the control when a prefetch is considered. If it drops below P thresh, consider prefetching, okay. The threshold of valid descriptors in host memory, a descriptor prefetch. I'm curious if it's not doing anything until there's a certain amount of packets. But I don't think so on this. Right back threshold. Granularity. No. That's not looking like it. Interrupt delay value. No, I don't think those are it. Let's check it on this one. Head right back is enabled. By default, it's zero. When it's set, that's ignored. And that's zero. TXD control, those are the thresholds. Priority, enable. Transmit queue enable? The fuck? Well, that sounds really important. Setting this bit initializes the TDT of a specific queue. Until then, the state of the queue is kept and can be used for... Okay, well that sounds incredibly important. The transmit queue enable. What the fuck? What is this in? This is the TXD control? TXD control, let's see on, on this one. What, what fucking bit was that? What bit? 25. Low threshold here. Why does it work in a VM? Because I think these VM NICs, the E1000 doesn't have it. Because the VM NICs only have single queues. So you don't have to enable the queue. You have to do this for the, um, we have to do queue enables for these. Uh, that's it, man. It's totally it. <sighs> well, we'll keep the prints. But yeah, so what we're gonna have, Nick registers, and this is going to be, um, queue enable, bool, and this is, um, if true, this nick requires setting the transmits and receive queue enable bits uh, in the 
TXD control, and I'm guessing the RXD control. We'll go find that and see if there's a receive analog, but I bet there is. Uh, filtering. RDT, RXD control, enable 25. Bits 25. Software flush. Enable software to trigger a... Um, Huh. Huh. Okay, so we'll set those. That sounds important. Q enable false. Not needed for those. Um and then we'll grab the ah. Grab this, yoink, paste, vroom, vroom. okay, so Q enable, true, and then we'll have RxD control and TxD control, I'm pretty sure they're all at the same addresses. Uh, TXD control, 3828. Okay, this is the TXD control. This is the trans, uh, transmit DMA control. I think is what they call it, right? Transmit descriptor control. And this is the receive. RxD control or CTL receive uh, RxD control. Oh, you know, we got to format these up, make them nice and pretty. We got to do that on the other one too. TXD control and RxD control. 3828, that's for TXD control. And then RXD control. Here, let's search for 3828 on that. And RXD control. Uh, legacy, legacy, legacy. That's receive, 2828. But I'm guessing TXD control. TD bal. Software should program that only when a Q is disabled. Yep. And then this is by default. It's cleared to zero on a reset. Okay, and this is 3828. Yeah, okay. Alright, guys, we got this. What was the one piece of software you couldn't exploit? It was a um, Wi-Fi chipset in an Android phone. It was really um, limited in the features that it had supported. So the chipsets themselves actually have different levels of feature sets that are basically enabled by the uh, firmware. And the firmware was like stripped of almost every single feature bit. It could do like almost the Pretty much the only super, super basic Wi-Fi. Frustrating, because Project Zero found bugs in it. Um, but the version they looked at had more features enabled. So I don't think I missed any, but I do kick myself for not uh, seeing if those bits did actually matter. Because I, I didn't know those feature bits were so dynamic. I just kind of assumed they would always be the same on most hardware. So we want to set... Uh, transmit enable and what do we do we do transmit path first and then we enable okay so we will do a 
enable TX. This will nick.write nick.regs.tx control, txd control, and then we'll or that one shift 25 bit bit 25 or nick.read nick.regs.txd control. RxD control, and this is if nick dot nicks nick dot whatever the fuck I name that variable q enable, and this is q's need to be enabled for these. Um, enable rx and tx q's if the nick requires. Ah, uh, this enablement. Okay. All right. Uh, so I think we're pretty much ready. I'm going to start rebooting these, and we'll hopefully fix this error before we reboot. I have confidence. Uh, 291. Nick dot... Regs, Q enable. Okay. So if Q enable, which is false for this, for this it's true, 28, 28, 38, 28, 28, 28, 38, 28. So for this it's true, which means we'll hit this, which means we'll enable the RxD control and the TXD control will set bit 25, which is enable for transmit and for receive. That's also enable, and that enables the queue. Uh, setting this bit initializes the head and tail registers of the specific queue. Okay, do I need to bump the tail? Do I need to set the head and tail after I set those? Probably. We'll see. This might be borked. Pack it out. I. I see a discover, and that's mine. Yeah, that's my packet. So we sent a packet. So that enabled sending. Now the question is, and I see, um, you know what, that, I think my DHP server doesn't like that packet. I think we're good. Um, I think we need to slightly change what we request. So I'm going to copy a more realistic one. Parameter request list. Um... Let me see what I do in my stack here in Sushi Roll. I think we might have to request some specific options. So here's our discover. Oh, that's literally we just send a discover. And that's it. No fields. Send the discover and then... Oh, we do send some options for this. <laughs> I, I bit bang these guys in. The source IP. So this looks like a Mac. So I got a Mac address here. So clearly that must be relatively important for a request. Requested IP address. So this says that this is a request. This is 3D. Uh, Python 3D, 61. Mm, no, that shouldn't, that shouldn't be required. Then 32, 50. We should send a 50. 
That's the requested IP address. And we do send that. Well, we send a discover, and then it isn't happy. Let me change my discover. And our DHCP implementation discover. We're only going to send the discover, which is what I do in my uh, sushi roll kernel. So we'll reboot these and see what we get. Otherwise, maybe it is caching. Maybe the packets are, no, I'm, I'm actually not, yeah, I'm not seeing the packets in Wireshark. It's not caching. So yeah, I'm not seeing the uh, DHCP offer. So it, it doesn't like, maybe that I'm requesting the message type, because that's, I think, implied. So it's probably like, what the fuck are you asking for? Um, yeah, I don't think that's a valid thing to request, to be honest. And let's take a look at the DHCP spec, or RFC. And we're gonna do a discover. Let's see, these guys are booting up. We're built, okay, we're good. Okay, reset my Wireshark. I see the discover. There we go, pack it out. And I sent the discover. Yeah, it's kind of weird. There's a broadcast flag in the boot P header. I bet that's it. Let's take a look if I set that. Send the request, copy into, copy in the chatter. Boy, this code was sucked. Transaction ID, hmm. Yeah, I don't set that. There is a broadcast flag that I could theoretically maybe need to set. One, six, hops, broadcast flag, client Mac, DHCP cookie, discover, And then an end. I'm gonna set that in boot p flags. I'm gonna set the broadcast bit. I mean, this works. So I don't know. That sends the discover. We make a discover packet, which is a default. Copy that shit in. All right, let me check my IP headers and stuff too. Discover. We have a different TTL, different size. I'm, I'm diffing two packets effectively right now to see where they differ. Unless it's because I'm not setting that checksum. Let me see if I do that in sushi roll. I would suspect, yeah, fuck yeah, I set that checksum right to zero. So how do these differ? Um, source port, desk port, those are fine. Okay. One has a broadcast flag. Transaction ID is different, of course. Other than that, we don't necessarily maybe request the parameters that it wants us to.
Yeah, I'm gonna set that broadcast flag, but I don't do that in mine, so let's... I don't understand how that works in the other one. But we'll see. Uh, flags. Fuck, I just, I just want this done, man. Flags. Op equals. You know what? No, I'm fine. Uh, okay, flags. Here we're gonna send a DHCP packet. Allocate a packet, create a DHCP packet. When we create the DHCP packet, we'll set this to broadcast. So header dot flags is equal to OX8000.2 big Indian. The U16. So that'll have the broadcast flag set, but I don't think that matters. Really don't. So we're resetting these servers. And this should still work in the VM. Oh, wow. Having that broadcast flag breaks it in the VM? Reset. Discover offer. Oh, I am getting an offer. No. That's the valid one. Okay. Discover. So that bit breaks it? What? At least in the VM? Let me check those flags. Yeah, I set the broadcast flag. All right. Dude, I have no fucking idea then. What? What is your opinion on Emacs? Uh, I'm impartial. I think it's okay. Um, any recommendations on things for beginners to check out? Uh, I can return here from sometime now and appreciate better what is happening. Um, there's not a great place to start for OS dev. It's kind of you just got to get into the weeds and start, you know, like pick a pet project and start working on it. There's some OS dev wikis. There's some... Uh, a couple, like, OS dev, I think, like, Bran, what's his name? There's, like, an OS dev tutorial thing, but it's really, I mean, right now we're doing protocol stuff, which is much easier than standard OS dev. That being said, I don't know why this isn't working. Because this does. Let's see. The fuck? Like, we're sending it to Discover. Oh. Uh, maybe it's because I just got a lease and it's sending the... Pack it out. I wonder if it if it's trying to send me something. Maybe it's trying to ARP me. Let's take a look. We won't do these flags. I bet, since it just gave me an IP, it's probably sending me a directed message. I should be able to pick that up. 
but maybe it's arping me. No, it wouldn't have to arp me because we we tell it how to contact me through the hardware address. What? There's a chance it is sending me a packet and I'm just not seeing it on my Wireshark. <clears throat> Cause I don't have a hub, I have a switch. Um, and that might be sending it targeted. Yeah, but I see the other offers. It's offering to broadcast. Discover. All right, we're setting that, we're setting the broadcast, but we're gonna see what it does. Get that rebooted. I don't think this will fix it, but send the broadcast flag. Everything zeroed out to discover. And a bunch of padding. I don't think I need the padding. Uh, uh, Soft sushi roll. Kernel source BSP net DHP. We just literally send up a, a clean discover. We put in the chatter, but we should do that. Yeah, we copy in the channel address. Or the client hardware address, not the channel address. Um... All right, pack it out. Oh, I got an offer for that. Yeah, I got an offer for that. Yep, both of them got offers when I had that broadcast bit set. The other one acted, I think. No, that was a request for something else. I see discover and an offer and that's definitely mine. And then I'm probably failing because it's not giving me all the options I want. I'm asking for that in the server. I'm seeing the response. I get a server identifier. Okay, maybe the RX side of things isn't working. Maybe I do need caches disabled. Maybe I should use the the head check like I was doing. Let me go find that code quick. That one. Well, that's on transmit, so that doesn't matter. Receive. While read volatile status on a head and one is not zero. You know what? I think we gotta set the... I think we have to enable the queues prior to programming those. Because I think those, re I think those are resetting the head, and then let's get rid of the broadcast. I don't think we need this. Well, we'll we'll put it there just so I can see. I think that request that it broadcasts instead of unicasts the uh, packet back to me, but I'm pretty sure that those are resetting the. Um, I think the spec said. Disable queue. Setting this bit initializes the head and tail of the specific queue. Until then, it's kept in a scriptures exist. The scriptures are fetched immediately. Actual receive starts only if that is enabled. Yeah, so I think that's what we need to do. I think we probably fixed it here. 
I don't know. I'm not confident in that. But we have to, um, we have to, <sighs> so we enable the cues and then we program them. Okay, here we go on this machine. Hey, we got a packet. Okay, well clearly that fixes that issue. Now... I don't seem to like that offer it's giving me, but clearly we're getting packets now. It's sending me an offer, and let me check source port, desk port. All right, obviously we're getting packets now, which is nice. So yeah, those we have to enable those queues, and then we program them. Technically, we probably should enable the cues and then bump the heads and tails. Tables the queue, initializes those. Setting it enables the RDT, RDH and RDT. So yeah, I think we set those. We reprogram the base. I mean, clearly it's working now. So now we just have to see uh, what in our DHP stuff we're requesting. Got packets. Where do I print got packet? Oh, in here. So again, those packets, we're turning those out. And then this is going to expect that we get an offer back. And we do. Beautiful, and then we need to get a server IP and an offer IP. This server is responding to me with a... Yeah, it's giving me a server identifier. And it's an offer. Oh, desk Mac is not Mac. Yeah, because we have broadcast set. Yep, yep, yep. The desk Mac is not us because we have the broadcast bit set. That's how we broke it. We fixed it. It's done. It works. It was a little 100% work. Get rid of all these prints. Easy. Fucking easy. Fucking easy. All right, uh, reboot this, get the servers rebooting. So that got a lease on all of its NICs. There are two network cards here, it got two leases. All right, then this will come up and this will work. No fucking problem. Easiest dev of my life. Uh, let me see the enablement procedure on this. Um, software init, init sequence. Okay, we'll read through that. Make sure we do that in the right order. Um, do that, enable receive. Okay. Obviously, this is just going to work now. Obviously. Obviously. Yeah, there we go. We got an IP. And we didn't get an IP for this device, only for one of them. And we got an IP for this. Once again, only for one of them. Um... Uh, what is, what are these servers? These are, let me see. Uh, 
Um, I wonder if those one of those is the. I wonder if one of those is the. Um, IP mine, and we're not gonna get a lease off it. Oh, one of those isn't fucking plugged in. Both both of these only have uh, one cable plugged in. That's totally why, and we don't have a timeout on our uh, DCP lease. So let me go plug in both cables. I'll be right back. All right, this will be easy now. We just gotta reboot these. And those will get two DHP leases, 100%, no problem. But yeah, I just, I literally didn't have the other Nyx plugged in. And we don't have timeouts on DHP and that's something we'll add. But other than that, I think the code's pretty solid. That's for testing. It's gonna print to get a lease. This is, uh, get status, get commits, get add kernel source time, get commit am, uh, DHCP, uh, and EDP stacks working. We, ha we still have to add an ARP, but I think that'll come another time. We gotta add timeouts for that. That machine's still rebooting. There we go. Hey, hey, we got two leases. Beautiful. Fucking easy. Uh, okay, maybe that one didn't get reset. I reset that one again. But yeah, all course online. 1.34 second boot time. That's slow as shit. But the leases actually took a lot of time. Kind of bottlenecking on the leases and probably printing a little bit to the screen. All right. All right. Why is that machine not coming up? Oh, it expired. Ah. Okay, uh, reset server, Pew, done. All right, now this one will boot. Obviously it fucking works. No problems there, got that pushed up. And then I'm gonna have to add timeouts on, uh, timeouts on DHCP and add ARP. So here we'll um, add DHCP uh, timeouts. Uh, currently, DHP blocks until uh, a response. Uh, we should have timeouts. 
and some retries. Okay, and then we'll say um, implement ARP. And what else do we need? We need to, I don't know, that's about it. It's actually in pretty good shape, to be honest. Oh, here we go, we're gonna see on this machine. Do, 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 do. Hey, two IPs booted in 1.2 seconds. All right, well, clearly this works. So this is working on real hardware. This is testing on three different network cards. I think I'm pretty happy with that. I think I'm gonna call it there. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Hope you had a blast. Make sure you check out my Twitter and my YouTube and my VODs. Have fun. Make sure you follow so you, so you know I'm here. Oh, I just joined. All right, well, that was pretty solid. We got, uh, we got those DHP leases all coming up. <laughs> Fucking great. Super cool. When next online, I probably should do some work tomorrow. Some real work. But I'll probably stream tomorrow. It won't be a 16 hour stream, but it'll probably be 8 hours or something. So I'll probably put in like an 8 hour work day and then uh, try and stream for 8 hours. Because we need to do ARP. We need to implement timeouts on these so they like fail if they can't get a lease. And then I want to make a nicer API that's for kind of users that will have this lease. So when we connect, we'll grab a lease. And then um, you'll be able to just send and receive and it will just use the lease built in. And this will allow you to figure out which IPs you can route to which networks. And we can kind of make that whole thing, that whole flow a little bit better. Um, now that we have an actual IP, but yeah, we'll need ARPs and then we'll probably implement TFTP next. Um, let me see what TFTP is. I, th I think TFTP is like a joke to implement. Like actually zero fucking work. Um, uh, protocol. I think it's literally like four bytes for a header. Rev one. Okay, this. It's old, which is good. I like that. Um, transfer identifiers between zero and six five five three five. I think that means that there's a limited size. Um, yeah, you could send like maybe fourteen hundred times that. You could send like 91 megs, maybe. So we'll probably implement our own protocol. Whatever we'll do, we're gonna get some files into this shit so we can start running a VM. Anyways, thanks everyone for tuning in. See y'all around next time. What are your thoughts on WireGuard? I haven't heard of it, sorry.